the rules committee will come to order. Uh, I think we may have finally, finally caught lightning in a bottle. Uh, for many years, a coalition on Capitol Hill, Democrats and Republicans, House and Senate, have been pushing not only to end endless wars, but to re-examine the broad executive powers that get us into global conflicts in the first place. Despite, by the, but despite the bipartisan support for change, it has sometimes felt like a lonely battle because no president in all my time here has been open to even considering reigning in their own power. I'm an optimistic guy, but even I was starting to worry that we might not get this done anytime soon. But on January 20th, we inaugurated a president who spent decades grappling with the limitations of the War Powers Resolution and looking for a way to change it. Earlier this month, the White House reiterated its support for reining in um, executive war power. That really was the missing piece, the political will from the White House. Now uh, we have a real chance uh, to not only uh, look at existing AUMFs, which I hope that we do, but to also reform the war, war powers resolution itself. This resolution passed when Richard Nixon was president nearly 50 years ago, over his veto, I might add. Everything has changed since then, when we fight, how we fight, and why we fight. We have a responsibility to make sure that this resolution changes too, so it works in the modern age for a modern Congress and for a modern military. Uh, but quite frankly, it is more than that. In 1964, President Lyndon Johnson said, it's damn easy to get into a war, but it's awful hard to extricate yourself if you get in. If you, if, if you get in. Well, we all, uh, we know all too well the truth of that statement. That's why we're here today. It can't, be, it can't be easier to get into a war than it is to get out of one. And it can't be that Congress and the people that we represent are sidelined on the life and death question of when we go to war. That's just not my view. Uh, that's what the Constitution tells us. The framers put the power to declare war in the hands of Congress. The framers knew firsthand the dangers of all that, all that power being in the hands of one person. They knew that uh, they knew what the cost of war, both in terms of the loss of life and the loss of funding and opportunity, meant for real people. Now we've strayed from that vision. Uh, there's no doubt about that, and the results have been devastating. Presidents increasingly go it alone and tell Congress the bare minimum about military actions. Presidents and their lawyers look to a 20-year-old authorization of force to justify their actions. If we do nothing. Uh, we shouldn't be surprised by the outcome, uh, which will be more, not less, executive control over consequential questions of when we go to war. So Congress is going to act, uh, first here at the Rules Committee this morning, and then at the House Foreign Affairs Committee under the leadership of Chairman Meeks uh, later this afternoon. Today, we will hear from a variety of witnesses to better understand what reforms are necessary and what is possible under the House rules. Ranking member uh, Cole and I have assembled today's panel not to check the Republican or Democratic, uh, or Democratic box. Now, we know we're brilliant, uh, but we didn't invite you here to tell us how smart we are, uh, though unless Mr. Cole objects, that's certainly okay. Uh, but instead, the ranking member and I wanted a panel that could give us their best advice as we th think through the important question before us. Uh, some of you work for Republican for a Republican president. Some of you work for a Democratic president. But it's not your politics that is important to us. It's your experience. Because if we're going to chart a better path on how to wage war and achieve peace, we need your help uh, and we need your candid advice. So with that, I now am happy to turn over to my ranking member, Mr. Cole, for any remarks that he wishes to make. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me associate uh, myself with your remarks. Uh, particularly about the unique opportunity I think we have in front of us, and I, I will join you in giving the administration uh, credit for that. They've opened the door. It's really up to us to walk through it. Uh, today's original jurisdiction hearing covers a critical issue facing Congress, the scope of power and authority concerning matters of war. Today's hearing follows on our hearing last year covering the unique powers entrusted to the legislative branch under Article I of the Constitution. Frankly, there's no topic more important or serious than Congress's authority to declare when, where, and how our nation chooses to go to war. I first want to thank Chairman McGovern for arranging today's hearing. 
uh, though the chairman and I disagree on a number of things, defending the constitutional authority entrusted to Congress is not one of them. Both of us are equally concerned about the erosion of congressional authority in matters of war in recent decades, particularly given the corresponding expansion of executive branch authority since the end of World War II. And both of us believe strongly that we must rein in this expansion and reassert congressional primacy. In Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, Congress has granted specific powers in relation to war. Among these is the executive power to declare war, the power to uh, raise, or excuse me, the exclusive power to declare war, the power to raise and support armies and a navy, uh, and to make rules for regulation of the armed forces. There's an inherent tension between congressional authority to declare war and the president's power under Article II of the Constitution to be the commander in chief of the armed forces. But in recent years, the trend has been for the executive branch to seize authority at the expense of Congress. In 1973, Congress passed the War Powers uh, Resolution, which became law over President Nixon's veto. And I just want to pause and insert, important to remember, it became law over the president's veto. That meant it was a bipartisan decision by Congress because you wouldn't have been able to overcome that uh, veto without uh, both Republican and Democratic support. And that was done at a time of war when we were still deeply involved in Vietnam. It tells you how strongly our predecessors, I think, felt about trying to get uh, uh, rein this problem in. Uh, the War Powers Resolution states clearly that the president cannot commit the United States to an armed conflict without the consent of the U.S. Congress. In the event that the United States engages in hostilities with a foreign power, the War Resol Powers Resolution requires congressional notification and forbids the use of armed force after 60 calendar days without an authorization for the use of military force. In recent years, presidents from both parties have committed American military forces to combat without consulting Congress. In 1993, President Clinton committed American military forces to the UN-led intervention in Bosnia. In 2011, President Obama committed American military forces to NATO-led intervention in Libya. And American ground forces have been president in Syria during both the Obama and Trump administrations. Each of these incidents has represented a further expansion of independent executive practice to commit American armed forces and a further erosion of congressional authority. Given this backdrop, it's appropriate for the Rules Committee to now examine the War Powers Resolution. It's clear to me that the existing War Powers Framework is no longer sufficient to safeguard congressional authority. I'm hopeful that our hearing today will shed additional light on what reforms can and should be made to ensure that Congress will continue to fulfill its constitutional obligations and that executive action will be undertaken within the bounds of clear statutory authority. Of course, such a hearing would not be complete without noting the five ongoing authorizations for the use of military force that are still active today. The 2001 AUMF, authorizing military force against nations, organizations, or persons responsible for sep the September 11th attacks. And the 1991 and 2002 uh, AUMFs, authorizing military force against Iraq, continue to force enforce today and have not been repealed or replaced by updated authorities. Both Chairman McGovern and I have expressed deep concern about this state of affairs, and he and I have both been supportive of efforts to update these authorities. In the 20 years since September 11th attacks, America continues to engage against terrorist forces and their backers. But neither the 2001 AUMF, broad as it is, nor the 2002 AUMF, were ever intended to serve as a blank check authorizing any and all use of military force wherever in the world the president determines it is necessary. I'm in full agreement with my colleagues who support reforming the 2001 AUMF, but I would also caution that we should not simply repeal these authorities without ensuring there's an appropriate replacement. This is a bipartisan debate Congress should be having, and indeed must have in the months to come. We owe it to the institution and the American people to ensure that Congress has held a thorough debate on committing American troops to combat in accordance with our constitutional responsibility. With that, Mr. Chairman, I thank you again for calling today's hearing and thank our witnesses for being here today, sharing their important insights and expertise with us. And I want to thank the staff on both sides of the dais for their hard work in putting this hearing together. I think it will be an enormous benefit to, to the Congress. And, uh, thank you for your leadership in that respect, Mr. Chairman. I thank you and yield back.
So I thank the ranking member for his excellent opening statement, and I too want to thank the staff on uh, on uh, both the majority and minority side uh, for all their work in helping us prepare this. You know, um, as some of you may recall, um, before the pandemic, we began a series of hearings uh, in the Rules Committee to look at how Congress has ceded or abdicated uh, much of its constitutional responsibility in a whole range of areas to the executive branch. And uh, uh, and then we, we held one hearing, but then the pandemic hit us and and went on to have to deal with other things, but uh, but I uh, but I appreciate the ranking member's um, uh, statement, uh, and I sh certainly share his uh, his views. Uh, and now on to our witnesses. Uh, let me introduce with the, uh, them. Uh, Rebecca Ingber, Ingber is a professor at Cardozo Law School and taught at Boston University Law School for five years before moving to Cardozo Law School law last year. Prior to this, she served in the Office of the Legal Advisor at the Department of State. She is a senior fellow at the Rice Center on Law and Security at NYU. Her scholarship focuses on international and foreign affairs law, as well as presidential power. She has worked on litigation before both the U.S. Supreme Court and the International Court of Justice. Uh, John Bellinger uh, works on global law and public policy practice at the Arnold and Porter Firm. Prior to this, he has served as legal advisor to the State Department, senior associate counsel to the president, and legal advisor to the National Security Council during the George W. Bush administration. He has extensive experience in U.S. foreign relations and in litigation in, in U.S. courts and before the international institutions. Uh, Tess uh, uh, Bridgman is co-editor-in-chief of Just Security. Before this, she served as deputy legal advisor to the National Security Council and worked at the State Department in the Office of the Legal Advisor. She is also a senior fellow and visiting scholar at the Rice Center on Law and Security at NYU. In addition, she served as special assistant uh, and associate counsel to the president under the Obama administration. We are grateful for all three of you being here uh, today, and we look forward to being enlightened. So let me begin uh, by uh, uh, yielding to Ms. Um, Ingber to begin. Thank you so much, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the committee. I want to thank you for your leadership in convening this hearing. We are here today in part because we can no longer answer a simple question. With whom are we at war? When I say we cannot answer, I mean the American people, I mean members of Congress, I even mean members of the U.S. executive branch who are prosecuting the many violent conflicts the United States is engaged in across the globe with groups most Americans have never heard of. Despite con Congress's constitutional power over the decision to take the country to war, the United States is at war today with groups and within countries that Congress has never determined the nation should be fighting. This is not how these decisions are supposed to work. When the framers granted to Congress and not the president the power to declare war, along with a host of other war regulating powers, this wasn't a haphazard decision. They were not unaware that decision making by a legislative body a body that at the time required travel by horse in order to convene would be a slower process than decision making by the president. But the framers pointedly gave this power to Congress specifically because they feared consolidating war making power in one individual and because they valued the benefits of placing the decision to go to war in a slower, more deliberative branch. In doing so, they recognized a narrow, implicit exception for the president to repel sudden attacks in the event of a true attack on the nation when there would be no time to convene Congress to act. Today, this narrow carve out for the president to act without Congress in exceptional circumstances has been distorted beyond recognition. Decades of presidential administrations and more pointedly executive branch lawyers have aggressively construed the president's powers to act unilaterally. They have done through, so through expansive interpretations of the president's constitutional powers and through expansive interpretations of congressional statutes. They have claimed that a whole range of military actions that look an awful lot like war, from drone strikes on non-state actors to taking out another state's military capabilities, are not technically war of the kind that implicates Congress's constitutional powers. They have interpreted the limits Congress enacted in the War Powers Resolution as an additional delegation of authority to the president. They have creatively interpreted the 2001 and the 2002 AUMFs to extend to conflicts with actors that Congress could not have had in mind when it passed those statutes, in many instances to groups that did not even exist until years later. 
And in some extreme cases, executive branch lawyers have claimed that the president can go beyond even the significant authorities Congress has granted him to use force against any perceived threat, or even to affect regime change if the president perceives it to be in the national interest. Now, I don't suggest that presidents have done all of this in bad faith. In many cases, they are simply acting in what has often been a power vacuum, but it does not have to work this way. And I want to recognize the significant bipartisan efforts this committee and others have made to pushing ahead to reset the balance. And I want to suggest just a few overarching considerations as you move ahead. First, it is critical to take a holistic approach to reform. The president's claims to power here are like a balloon. If we press on one side of the balloon, for example, if Congress were to simply repeal the AUMFs, this will apply pressure to the other side of the balloon, leading the president to rely more significantly on sole constitutional authority. So effectively reasserting Congress's role in decisions to go to war requires moving forward with both AUMF and general war powers reform together. Second, these legislative solutions must have teeth. They should include concrete consequences, like a funding cutoff with a shorter clock. Put the president and executive branch officials on notice from the outset that if they can't get congressional support for their actions, their funding has an expiration date, and then clearly define the trigger for when that clock starts. Old AOMFs should be repealed, and any new authorization should be made only after the case for force is presented to you and analyzed, and should include precise language regarding the targets of force and how and where that force can be used and when the authorization will sunset. A new AUMF, and this is key, a new AUMF should not be a blank check for the president to use force forever and without ever having to return to Congress. And finally, Congress must be involved in decisions to deploy forces abroad, and those decisions must take into account the risk to those troops and the risks of creating new conflicts should those troops use force in response to threats to themselves or to partner forces. These are all consequential war and peace decisions, and we need to ensure that they are taken in a way that respects our democratic system with transparency, with deliberation, and with an opportunity for the people's representatives in Congress to weigh in just as our Constitution directs. Now, some will argue that war powers reform would be dangerous, that it might hamstring the president's ability to defend the nation. But under the Constitution, the president will never lack authority to stop an actual attack on the nation. Rest assured that the executive branch will continue to aggressively protect the president's prerogatives. So we need Congress to protect its institutional power and along with it, the American people's voice in some of the most significant decisions that we make as a nation. Thank you again for inviting me to testify. I look forward to answering any questions the committee might have. I uh, thank you very, very much. I now yield to the Honorable John uh, Bellinger. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cole and members of the committee, Thank you for inviting me to testify today about the War Powers Resolution and Congressional and Presidential War Powers. I really want to applaud the committee's interest uh, and uh, passion about taking up this subject. I do feel that the moment is this year to try to get some War Powers reform done. By way of background, I served for nearly two decades as a national security lawyer under both Democratic and Republican presidents including as senior associate counsel to President George Bush and legal advisor to the National Security Council in the first term of the Bush administration, and then later as the Senate confirmed legal advisor for the State Department in the second term, serving under Condoleezza Rice in both positions. I was in the Situation Room during the 9-11 attacks, and I served in the White House during the Iraq War. I was involved in drafting and interpreting both the 2001 and 2002 authorizations to use military force and in preparing all of the reports submitted by President Bush to Congress under the War Powers Resolution between 2001 and 2009. To start with my bottom line, the current laws governing presidential war powers are outdated and should be revised. The War Powers Resolution of 1973 should be updated to reflect modern military, and political realities. Congress should repeal the 2002 AUMF relating to Iraq, and it should revise the 2001 AUMF against terrorist groups responsible for the 9-11 attacks to authorize the president to use force against terrorist groups that today threaten the United States. Successive presidents have adopted increasingly contorted interpretations of all three laws, and Congress has acquiesced in these interpretations rather than vote on new authorizations. 
This is bad legal and constitutional practice. So to begin with the War Powers Resolution, although presidents have sometimes had difficulties complying with the 48-hour reporting requirement, they've struggled in particular with the resolution's requirement that the president terminate any use of U.S. armed forces within, 30, well, within 60 days unless Congress has issued a specific authorization. So for example, President Obama continued the use of U.S. military force against Libya for more than 60 days in 2011 after concluding that U.S. military operations did not actually constitute hostilities within the meaning of the resolution. And he then continued the use of U.S. military force against ISIS in Iraq and Syria for more than 60 days in 2014 after concluding in a legal stretch that the use of force against ISIS had actually been authorized by Congress in the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs. Now in 2008, the National War Powers Commission, a bipartisan commission chaired by former Secretaries of State James Baker and Warren Christopher, and before which I testified at the time, issued an excellent report that called the War Powers Resolution impractical and ineffective and not serving the rule of law. They recommended the resolution be repealed and replaced with the mandatory congressional executive consultation process. I commend that report to you and I strongly support the War Powers Consultation Act that the commission recommended. Now let me turn to the 2001 and 2002 AUMFs. The 2001 AUMF continues to serve an important legal purpose, but as time has passed, it has become increasingly outdated. And I would note here, that 10 years ago, in 2010, shortly after I left the Bush administration, I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post saying that it was outdated then, and that was 10 years ago. It does not provide clear legal authority to use force against terrorist groups that have been formed or expanded after the 9-11 attacks. As a result, I have long advocated revising the 2001 AUMF to update it to address contemporary terrorist threats. I especially applaud Senator Tim Kaine on the Senate side for his efforts over so many years to forge a bipartisan consensus in the Senate to revise the 2001 AUMF. An updated AUMF is legally important to give our military clear statutory authority to fight terrorist groups that threaten the United States today. And it's constitutionally important to demonstrate that Congress has authorized the actions our military is taking rather than simply acquiescing in increasingly strained executive branch interpretations of the 2001 AUMF enacted 20 years ago before most members of the 117th Congress were elected. To be clear, by my count, only about 15% of the current Congress were serving when the 2001 AUMF was enacted. Now, members of Congress have understandable concerns about approving a broad new authorization and extending what many view as a forever war. However, I am convinced that Congress can come together to agree on a new AUMF that provides the president and our military the clear legislative authorization with appropriate limitations that they need to defend the United States against persistent threats from modern terrorist groups. With respect to the 2002 AUMF, the threat posed by Saddam Hussein's regime was the primary focus of the law, and I was in the White House at the time it was drafted, but it has continued to be cited by Presidents Bush, Obama, and Trump as authorization for a range of military activities in Iraq through 2020. In 2014, for example, President Obama cited the 2002 AUMF, in addition to the 2001 AUMF, as authority for the use of force against ISIS in Iraq. And even more controversially, as members know, President Trump cited the 2002 AUMF as authorization for the U.S. drone strike on January 2nd, 2020, that killed Iranian intelligence chief Qasem Soleimani while he was visiting Iraq. In my view, both of these latter interpretations of the 2000 AUMF were strained and unnecessary. In contrast to the 2001 AUMF, which should be updated, the 2002 AUMF should simply be repealed. In sum, I hope that Congress will repeal and update the 2001 AUMF, repeal the 2002 AUMF, and hold further hearings to consider potential revisions to the War Powers Resolution. Thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to your questions.
Thank you very much. Dr. Bridgman. Thank you, Chairman McGovern, Ranking Member Cole, and members of the Rules Committee. I'd like to reiterate the thanks expressed by my co-witnesses for your leadership on this important set of issues. I do think now is the time to act. All of us here today share a concern about the erosion of Congress's role in exercising its constitutional war powers. I was deeply involved both at the White House and prior to that in the State Department in how the president exercises his war powers, both under the Constitution and under statutes provided by Congress delegating authority to take the nation to armed conflict. Now, this concern is not new about the erosion of Congress's powers, but it has gained increased urgency in an era marked by sprawling long-term conflicts that Congress has not explicitly weighed in on. I look forward to discussing with you today how to reverse this trend so that the people's representatives exercise their authority and fulfill their duty to decide when and how the United States uses armed force abroad. In my written testimony, I offered six concrete proposals for war powers reform, and I want to highlight those for you today because I hope they can form the basis for part of our discussion. These reforms, in my view, are achievable and they're mutually reinforcing. They further goals that I believe we share, restoring Congress's role in deciding when and how to go to war without taking away from the president the authority to use defensive force when necessary. And this brings me to the first reform. The War Powers Resolution should clearly delineate two circumstances when the president may use force without prior congressional authorization. They're very simple. First, to repel an imminent or sudden attack on the United States. And second, to protect, evacuate, or rescue U.S. nationals in situations of peril. But for other types of interventions, including the ones that Chairman McGovern and Ranking Member Cole brought to our attention, Congress should vote. Second, the resolution's key term hostilities must be defined. The resolution's core requirement that the president must terminate off unauthorized hostilities after 60 days has been rendered all but useless by the executive's exceedingly narrow definition of the term hostilities. To avoid continued end runs around the termination requirement, hostilities should be defined to include any lethal or potentially lethal use of force by or against US forces including when deployed by remote weapon systems like drones or cyber weapons, and including in low intensity or intermittent engagements, which have become the norm in recent conflicts. Third, while defining hostilities will make the termination clock meaningful again, the 60-day time period is too long. It incentivizes the executive branch to start engagements that are not defensive in nature, or to turn defensive strikes into escalatory conflicts, before the clock runs out. But there's a simple solution, shorten the clock. Fourth, enforcement. To add teeth back into the War Powers Resolution, it needs a clear, automatic funds cutoff. This would apply to any activity that is not consistent with the statute. An enforcement mechanism should not require a vote to take effect, and it certainly should not require a supermajority of both houses. Think of it this way. The statutory requirement being enforced is merely preserving a power that Congress has already been delegated in the Constitution. Fifth, as I documented in the War Powers Resolution Reporting Project at NYU Law's Recenter on Law and Security, which analyzes all of the unclassified 48-hour reports since the War Powers Resolution was enacted, presidents generally aim to comply with the War Powers Resolution's reporting requirements, but they often provide boilerplate language to Congress. Congress needs much more meaningful information to understand the reasons for an introduction and its full implications. You can ask yourself, what would you need to know to take an informed vote on authorizing a use of force or letting an automatic funds cutoff kick in? That should guide us in terms of what the president is required to provide. Sixth and finally, I'll agree with Professor Ingber with uh, John Bellinger, the 1991 and 2002 AUMFs are operationally unnecessary and leaving them on the books only makes them susceptible to abuse. But we should be clear that it is the 2001 AUMF that has been stretched beyond recognition by administrations of both parties and must be repealed. If circumstances require a new force authorization, it must include explicit boundaries to avoid repeating the situation we find ourselves in today. I included specific guardrails in my written testimony that I'd be happy to discuss with you in today's hearing. 
In sum, the status quo in which the people no longer have a voice in matters of war and peace is untenable. The executive cannot be left to check itself any longer. But this means Congress must have the courage to assert itself on these issues, and I believe it is starting to do so. Recent votes to end U.S. involvement in the disastrous conflict in Yemen and to avert war with Iran show that this is possible. But the result in each case, a presidential veto that was foreseeable and the continuation of the status quo, shows that Congress's tools are inadequate. The War Powers Resolution must be updated to ensure Congress is able to assert itself when it has the political will to do so. I hope that the reforms we discussed today will put us on that path, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of you, all three of you, for an excellent testimony. Uh, and before I get to my questions, I, I just saw my friend, Mr. Perlmutter from uh, Colorado, um, come online. I, I think I speak for everybody on this committee when I say that all of us are uh, in deep uh, shock uh, over the shootings uh, in Boulder. Uh, and uh, obviously, our our prayers are with uh, the people of Colorado, the, the family members of the victims. Um, a police officer was shot uh, who had a young family. It, it really, uh, it, this is madness. And um, it's, and the subject of another hearing is we, 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 we need to do more than just express our thoughts and prayers over these tragedies. But um, I just, I wanted to make sure that uh, we acknowledge what happened. Um, in any event, um, again, I want to thank the witnesses for your, uh, your testimony. Um, you know, the Rules Committee uh, is not always associated with bipartisanship, and, um, you know, uh, we, we don't always hold hands and sing kumbaya together. I mean, uh, but at the risk of shocking everybody, I think uh, I want to start by highlighting, I think, some of the things that we agree on. Um, I mean, each of our witnesses noted in oral or written testimony that you believe Congress should repeal the 2002 authorization for the use of military force. You all seem to agree that we should either repeal or, rep or repeal and replace the 2001 authorization of military force. Uh, and each of you said that you believe that the War Powers Resolution is not working and is in need of reform. Um, is that right? Does everybody agree? All the witnesses agree on that? I'm seeing yes. Okay. All right. Uh, Mr. Bellinger, um, just briefly, tell us. What is the Office of Legal Counsel, uh, and what role does it play in the war powers discussion? So let me separate the, the couple of the players that are involved here. Uh, the Office of Legal Counsel is the part of the Justice Department, which by statute uh, issues opinions interpreting the law. They under delegated authority from the Attorney General. So they uh, are essentially the president's uh, uh, lawyers uh, for the interpretation uh, of statutes, and they write uh, opinions. Uh, at the White House lawyers, and I was a White House lawyer, so I was part of the White House Counsel's Office and the lawyer for the National Security Council before I moved to become General Counsel of the State Department. At the White House, we rely on the Office of Legal Counsel for those opinions, but they are not necessarily binding uh, on the president. Uh, the president and the White House lawyers do look to the Office of Legal Counsel uh, to write these opinions on war powers, but it's ultimately up to the president and to the counsel of the president to decide what legal positions they want to take. Thank you. So, um, Professor Ingber, uh, you're a law professor. Um, I'm not a lawyer, uh, uh, so please make this as, as simple as possible for me. Uh, save the tough stuff for Professor Raskin, who's a constitutional uh, expert. But uh, can you tell me where the role of the Office of Legal Counsel can be found in the Constitution? So there's no role for the Office of the Legal Counsel in the Constitution. The Constitution um, provides that the, that the president will get advice from advisors, and these are presidential advisors. Um, they There is no reason to think, you know, sometimes OLC memoranda get um, discussed as if they are Supreme Court right. opinions. And I think it's important to keep in mind that that's not what they are. These are the president's lawyers. Now, the also, you know, um, 
alumni from the Office of Legal Counsel will tell you that that and and lawyers in that office will tell you that they seek to provide the best view of the law when they are giving legal advice to the president. But they will also tell you, and I think Professor Goldsmith will tell um, HVAC committee when, when they meet later today, that they are also doing so from the perspective of lawyers who's, who have a client and that client is the president and their job is to protect presidential power. So the president has a set of lawyers who view it as their institutional prerogative to protect presidential power. And there's no reason for the rest of the branches to view those lawyers' positions as if they are, you know, um, written down in the Constitution, right? Um, you have your own institutional prerogative to interpret the law as well. Yeah, and I, and I apologize for kind of these kind of very simplistic questions, but I want to get them on the on the record. Okay, so tell me where the Constitution gives lawyers advising the president the power to settle conflicts between the Congress and the president over questions like what constitutes a war and who should declare it. Right, you're not going to find that in the Constitution. Um, okay. And it, that might be just the answer you were looking for. Yeah, no, it, yeah, it is. I mean, it, I mean, I, I, because I, I because because I'm, I I was getting a little confused because we keep on hearing about the OLC opinions to establish legal precedent to engage military conflicts. If the OLC isn't supposed to determine what the law is and what the law means, then who's supposed to decide that? Well, each of the branches has a responsibility to make that decision for itself. So OLC is providing a really important function for right. the president. The president has to figure out where the president thinks the line, those lines are, and it's very useful to have lawyers who are thinking about those issues all the time because the president needs to figure out when the president can act, right? Um, but the other branches have their own independent, I would say, authority and also obligation to do so for themselves. And so the way the Supreme Court has viewed these questions is they have looked to actions by both the branches as providing, you know, as precedent for determining where the proper alloc formal, alloc formal allocation should be today. And so when Congress has, act has, has not acted or has acted in ways that we might see as ambiguous, the Supreme Court has often read that as acquiescence in the president's actions. And All so right. the president has OLC standing up there with a memo, and perhaps Congress might need to have something of its own to be able to more effectively push back. Right. Yeah, because one of the frustrations is that when people refer to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court usually says that these are political questions uh, best decided by other branches. Um, and so, you know, um, Dr. Bridgman, we agree that the War Powers Resolution isn't working well. Uh, courts increasingly tell the president and Congress that these are political questions, so you all figure it out. Uh, and, and we've seen the president's lawyers kind of fill the vacuum. I mean, that's kind of what's happening. The president inevitably faces the voters, uh, as do members of Congress, which at minimum is a chance for the people to show how they think their leaders are doing, uh, doing their job. What ways can the people weigh in with White House lawyers? Um, I mean, who obviously are playing a big role uh, in this big pu public policy question. It's an important question, and I think uh, you know you, you put your finger on it when you talk about the the role of the the people. It's through Congress that the people are supposed to express their voice in the political process first and foremost, and the House of Representatives is of course the closest to the people. And this is something that I think is is vitally important as we think about how to police the executive branch. You mentioned political will, and that political will comes from this body, and it comes from understanding the desires and the needs of the people. I think we have a country that is war weary. We've been at war for two decades now. When you talk to service members and their families, and they talk about the multiple deployments that they've faced, the toll that that takes on their families, the toll that takes on military spouses and, and military children. When you think about the trillions of dollars that these wars have cost, and when you think about whether they in fact have made us appreciably safer over these last two decades, that's the people expressing their views to you as their representatives, and then it's up to Congress to engage. So Congress can do things like hold hearings. Congress can do things like take votes pursuant to the War Powers Resolution that happened in the 2019 and 2020 successfully for the first time ever. 
Uh, but fundamentally, as we've seen, those votes didn't change the status quo because the War Powers Resolution is broken. Right. And that's where you come in. Congress needs to provide a voice, but Congress also needs to ensure that it gives itself the tools to make that voice effective and meaningful. And I would just add one final point, which is that when Congress does so, when Congress legislates, that's what hems in the executive branch lawyers. So going on record with hearings absolutely is a step in the right direction. Expressing the voice of the people is vitally important, but legislating and actually ensuring that the executive branch will follow through with that legislation because it has meaningful enforcement mechanisms, that's how Congress expresses the voice of the people in its debates with Article 2. Yeah, no, one of our one of my frustrations has been that, um, you know, that Congress, um, you know, hasn't provided the proper oversight. Um, and you mentioned the, the war powers uh, votes that we've had. Um, you know, I've been part of uh, a group that has kind of forced some of those votes, but uh, they're not a substitute for, um, you know, thorough hearings, you know, a transparent process, more oversight. Uh, more discussion, um, and um, and it's too easy for people to find an excuse, you know, to table them or vote against them, um, even when they know that, you know, a particular policy is not is not going the way we want it to go. Look, we talked about these AUMFs. I, you know, I was around um, when these AUMFs were approved, um, and um, I don't think Congress 20 years ago could have anticipated what the reality in the world was going to be in 2021 um or that you know an authorization for the use of military force uh in afghanistan or iraq could somehow be used uh for something totally out of the <laughs> the realm of those those particular conflicts years later and we don't ever repeal these things right so i mean 40 years from now you know 50 years from now if we don't address these aumfs um they could be invoke to justify some sort of military intervention somewhere else uh in 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 the uh, in the world and so look i mean i think part of the, the 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 hope here and i think everybody on the panel is reinforcing this is that we we need to we need to reform the war powers uh, resolution um i'd like i i'd like to um if i could um uh professor ingbar um I'd like to turn to an issue near and dear to the rules committee's heart and that is process and procedure. Uh, Professor Ingbar, can you tell us briefly the history of the legislative veto, what it is, and what happened to it, as well as how, Congre how, how the Congress in 1973 might have relied on it when constructing the War Powers Resolution? I think you need to unmute. You, you would think after a year of teaching on, well, on board that I would at this we, point. We, we do that all the time. Uh, so, um, so the Supreme Court, in a decision that was not about war powers at all, um, in the Chadha decision, decided that Congress could not legislate, could not make law through um, uh, without bicameralism and presentment, by which, which is to say, without two houses of Congress voting on a resolution and then presenting it to the president for signature. And so, in order to, um, in order to make any law, the both houses of Congress. Have to um, have to agree on the text, and the president has to sign, or else Congress needs to override a potential veto with a two-thirds supermajority. Um, prior to the Supreme Court's decision, Congress had at times included in legislation, like in the War Powers Resolution, and I can read you the language we had you had included in the War Powers Resolution that um, provided for the ability for Congress to issue a concurrent resolution um, in which. Um, such forces shall be removed by the president if Congress so directs by concurrent resolution, which would have been a resolution that would not have then needed the signature of Congress. And so a mere majority of Congress would have been able to speak its mind and force the president to remove um, forces from, um, from, in, from hostilities when Congress chose to do so. But after Chadha, that's put that provision under a bit of a constitutional cloud. There are many who believe that um, that that has been that that enforcement mechanism has been entirely gutted. 
I don't think that's entirely the best way to read it. Um, the fact is that the Constitution entrusts Congress and not the president with the with the authority to declare war. And therefore, if the president is already engaging in an undeclared war, if the president is already engaging in hostilities without authorization from Congress, then the president may not have that authority to begin with. And so to the extent courts want to look to Congress's actions as acquiescence, then a concurrent resolution should be the absolute opposite of acquiescence in those actions. And so um, it is it is quite it is a totally plausible and I think the best reading to say that a concurrent resolution would be Congress putting its foot down and saying, no, we have not actually authorized the use of force here. We're being very clear about it and the court should not read this as an authorization to use force. That said, I don't think you can rely on the courts having that reading. And I don't think that, you know, and, and history has shown that the courts are exceedingly reticent to interfere when there is any hint of ambiguity about the about the um, the president's ability to use force and have even viewed lots of things, even at times a vote to eventually end um, the conflict as acquiescence in the conflict until that point. And so, you know, my view is that you can't really rely on the courts. What you need to do is create legislation that has, you know, use your own tools to create legislation that has real teeth. Right. Yeah. So since the 1983 Chada decision, Congress has tried to figure out how to bounce back. Um, on war powers, the Senate, led uh, in part by then-Senator Joe Biden, sought to address uh, constitutional issues by requiring a joint resolution, while the House kept the original approach, which was which called for a concurrent resolution. And for the people who are watching this at home, um, a concurrent resolution, which is often used to express the view of Congress, does not require the president's signature. Uh, the joint resolution, however, is more like a traditional bill, and uh, exact language must pass each house and must have the president's signature uh, in order to take effect. Otherwise, Congress can override a veto with two-thirds majority of each house. Uh, so, you know, so to start a war, uh, Congress needs a majority of each house and the president's signature. But Congress needs super majorities of both houses to stop a war over a president's objection. Uh, there's something wrong with that. Um, so to each witness, uh, let me, is, is this a good process uh, for questions of war and peace? Uh, is this uh, what, what you believe the founders envisioned? Um, you know, the president can go in alone uh, and only super majorities in Congress can stop him. Um, we can, I, this is for all three of you. Why don't we, Mr. Bellinger? Mr. Bellinger? Well, I'm reluctant to uh, wade into uh, either House or Senate uh, processes. Uh, I will simply say uh, that particularly when it comes to modern war powers, uh, and I think, you know, we really do, we have a living constitution, uh, but we do have to recognize that the uh, power of Congress to declare war enshrined in the constitution in the late 1700s has also got to reflect modern military realities where a president may need to act extremely quickly. We all know that. And you all know better than I do, both how difficult it can be to get both houses of uh, Congress to uh, convene, debate, uh, uh, agree on, uh, and uh, and authorize a use of force. Uh, so uh, I will say that I think we do need to give the president a good deal of flexibility to use force in certain situations that are going to be short of uh, a uh, significant war. Uh, and at the same time, we need to have procedures that will allow both houses of Congress uh, to act uh, quite quickly. I leave it to the two bodies, but it's always puzzled me why the bodies would have different procedures for voting on war powers. But my, my bottom line is uh, that I do think that both houses need to have procedures that will allow them, and indeed perhaps force them by self-discipline voted by yourselves, uh, to act quickly on war powers measures. Thank you, Adam. Uh, uh, Professor Ingber. So I, I absolutely agree that um, this is an untenable situation. I, I, I'm not sure I agree entirely with, um, with 
John Bellinger's um, suggestion of giving significant flexibility to the president to act before um, before those questions reach Congress. I, I think that there's a risk there for um, potential escalation into the very kinds of wars that that are then extremely difficult to rein in. And so I think there needs to be congressional um, intervention at the outset. You need to be in a situation where where the president is forced to bring the case to you, bring the case not only for why force is necessary in the circumstances, but also for what the end game will look like. Um, I think that will have a um, a useful um, effect on both the executive branch decision making and deliberation between the branches and transparency, and and it will also give the American people an opportunity to understand what we're doing. Um, so I think that's important, and I think the ways to do it. But I I agree entirely. Um, with Mr. Bellinger that um, there need to be expedited procedures for doing so. And one of the ways that I think you can sort of bind yourselves to the mast ex ante would be to create, for example, automatic funding cutoffs until Congress affirmatively authorizes um, force so that you, you you need to flip the status quo. Uh, you know, the way the current scenario is, the status quo is the president will act unless or until Congress exercises sometimes politically infeasible um, uh, power to rein the president in. And I think you need to flip that scenario so that the status quo is the president can't act unless Congress, unless and until Congress has the opportunity to weigh the evidence before it and authorize force. Thank you, Dr. Bridgman. Yeah, I'll answer your, your question in the negative. No, it's, it's certainly not what the Constitution envisioned, and it's certainly not tenable. But I want to just emphasize here that the constitutional design matters. It, it was this way for a reason, and there are real consequences when it's flipped on its head. It, it essentially inappropriately shields executive branch deployments of the military from democratic accountability. That's a real problem. If you need supermajorities of both houses to stop a war, there is not appropriate democratic accountability for uses of our military abroad. So I, I think uh, everything that uh, Professor Ingber just said is is exactly right. We we need those priority procedures to enable Congress to act quickly. I think that goes a, a long way towards ensuring that the, the president's uh, flexibility being hemmed in by a reformed war power statute doesn't have any detrimental consequences for our national security. Those priority procedures need to ensure that there can be a vote, there can be debate, although it needs to be a limited time period, and that the, the process continues so long as there is a simple majority in both chambers that that needs to be uh, that needs to to be enshrined in, and retained in an updated war powers resolution. But we also need that backstop. We need that enforcement mechanism, both to incentivize Cong incentivize the president not to get us embroiled in conflicts that can't be wound down, or to get us embroiled in in conflicts that are unnecessary before Congress has had a chance to weigh in, but also to ensure that Congress is brought into the process meaningfully well in advance, as Professor Ingber just said. And I, I want to emphasize here that the War Powers Resolution now has a consultation requirement. It is treated as a road bump, nothing right. more. Consultation is essentially a staff level call often. Um, sometimes the president himself has, has been involved, as Obama was uh, with Libya in 2011. That, that didn't do much to to assuage the concerns of, of members of Congress uh, when what ended up happening in the end looked a lot like finding a loophole through the enforcement mechanism that the War Powers Resolution had put in place. So consultation is important, but we need those back-end enforcement backstops for that consultation to actually be meaningful. Thank you. I appreciate it. Could I, could I come back yeah. in on this point? Oh, oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, and Mr. forgive me. I, I'm... I wouldn't normally do this in a normal hearing, but the staff tells me that you- We're not, like, we're not normal. We're not normal in the Rules Committee. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> you you slap me right down, Mr. Chairman, if I, if I get this wrong. I, I'm told by the staff that you really like to try to get the witnesses to, to, to sort of focus on what are their disagreements. And I, I want to say here, so you can see it right up front, it'll help to frame the hearing. Uh, both, the, uh, both professors, Bridgman and, and Ingber and I are old colleagues, as you could tell. All three of us served in the legal advisor's office, the State Department at office, of which we're all fond. But let me, let me focus this here. I think in, in theory, what they both say about the way uh, congressional processes and voting of war powers should work, that, that should be the perfect world. Uh, but I just do not think that we are going to see Congress voting uh, on every relatively 
minor use of force by the president. It has never worked that way in history under Republican or Democratic presidents, and it's not going to change that way in the future. Uh, the And in fact, even the Constitution itself says that the Congress's power is to declare war, not to uh, 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 nip the executive's power to use force uh, where necessary. So while, yes, if if Congress would be willing to convene rapidly uh, to authorize every uh, uh, use of force uh, uh, by the uh, by the military, you know that that's the way it ought to work. But I think what has happened over time, and what I think is really both the constitutional structure and the political reality, is that uh, both presidents of both parties, and I think my guess is that President Biden would say this. I do not say this as somebody who served in a Republican White House, uh, but certainly watching the way President Obama worked, is that presidents need a good deal of flexibility to use military force uh, for a variety of purposes. And, but there does reach a point where uh, Congress's authorization is necessary uh, to continue or to start a significant conflict. And I hope we'll come back to it, but this is exactly what the War Powers uh, re resolution that the National War Powers Commission recommended Congress uh, uh, consider. Yeah, well, just, you. Sure. Uh, just uh, to uh, clarify one point, because I think there might be more agreement uh, than was apparent here. Um, I don't think anyone is suggesting that the president should have to come to Congress to repel a sudden attack, to rescue our nationals, to evacuate an embassy, to do a hostage rescue, for example. These are the types of things that we see presidents doing quite quite often, unfortunately, in the modern in the modern world. And those are the things that would be preserved in these proposals. I think what we're talking about is exactly what uh, Mr. Bellinger just said. It's it's the the variety of purposes where we may disagree. So I think for humanitarian interventions, for stabilization missions, it's those kinds of advise and assist missions. It's those kinds of things that should be in Congress's hands. But I want to make sure we understand that there is common ground here with respect to preserving the president's ability to defend us against attack or to defend and our nationals in peril. Yeah. Well, thank you. Let me just let me just close and I yield to to uh, uh, the ranking member. You know, I I have gotten the impression that uh, various administrations, both Democratic and Republican administrations, have viewed Congress when it comes to the issues of war uh, as a nuisance, uh, as something to try to get around or to avoid. Uh, uh, that's why I think consultation has become uh, something that really isn't meaningful. Uh, but they try to find ways around us, uh, try to find ways to not have to come and have a debate on some of these uh, very, very important issues of life and death. Um, you know, we've had wars over, over the, uh, you know, over the time I've been in Congress, people have died in those wars. Um, there's a tremendous cost, uh, you know, not only in terms of human life, but in terms of uh, of treasure that that go along with these wars. And they and 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 the the notion that you know that a, a you know a branch of government can essentially be bypassed is is really really disturbing to me now so that's the fault on the executive there's a fault on the legislative branch too we have colleagues um on both sides of the aisle who quite frankly would rather not deal with these issues because um they could be very politically sensitive issues uh and sometimes people uh, prefer to be on the sidelines if things are going well, we'll cheer you on. If things aren't going so well, you say, I would have done this differently. Um, there's a little bit of what I call moral cowardice uh, over the years uh, in the legislative branch of basically ceding uh, our constitutional responsibilities uh, to the executive branch. You know, it doesn't take a lot to say that Congress should reclaim power ceded to or taken by the president. It doesn't take a lot of courage to say that. The hard part is actually doing it, right? And the normal playbook around here says that when my team is in the White House, I won't complain. Uh, well, my team is in the White House right now. Um, I support President Biden. I think he's a good person. Uh, I believe that he and his team are trying to make the best choices for the American people. Uh, and still, I believe what I believed last year when the other team's guy was in the White House and every year before then. And that is the process for how we wage war and establish peace in this country is broken. It is badly broken. And so let's not miss this opportunity to change course. 
let's focus on where we agree, uh, not just where we, we don't. Uh, and uh, again, this is the first, uh, I think, of several hearings on this topic. But I'm hopeful uh, that uh, that we will come up with a with a solution that we can bring to the floor and 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 move it forward. So with that, let me uh, let me yield to Mr. Cole, the ranking member, for any questions he may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, again, thank you for holding the hearing. Thank our witnesses. Great set of witnesses. Great discussion, and Chairman, great set of questions by you. Um, and let me just add, I couldn't agree more with you that uh, we need to take this rare opportunity. I've been in Congress since uh, January of 2003, uh, and uh, we've never had this kind of opening before. I would rather act and, and not get it quite right than do nothing at all and uh, and miss this really unique uh, opportunity to reassert congressional authority. You know, I think back over my time in Congress, I would have uh, opposed uh, President Obama's decision on Libya. I thought it was a mistake at the time. Uh, you know, we and I thought using NATO when no NATO country had been attacked was a real stretch. Uh, and I thought we sent a message to uh, uh, to 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 Tehran and to uh, North Korea: don't give up your WMDs. This is what happens to you when you do. Uh, it was a big mistake. On the other hand, I would have been very supportive of President Obama's decision uh, on ISIS in 2013, 2014. I think he did the right thing and. Uh, uh, didn't have an opportunity to really express myself clearly on either occasion. None of us did. Um, and, uh, you know, that needs to change. I, I agree very much with uh, uh, your remark, Mr. Chairman, and I'm going to flip what uh, Dr. Bridgman said. She talked about insulating the executive. I think you're exactly right when you talk about insulating Congress. And I think a lot of our members have wanted to avoid those kinds of decisions because you're held accountable pretty popular, you know, pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, going to war in 2003, a uh, decision actually made in October of 2002 was pretty popular. Wasn't very popular by 2005 and six. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I think uh, forcing Congress to put its fingerprints uh, on these kind of decisions is really something that, that we need to do. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, that's the American people then have the ability to hold us accountable and through us hold the executive branch accountable. Let me ask all three of you this question. It's a very unfair question, one that my staff didn't give me to ask, but uh, you've all been in very sensitive executive branch uh, positions when these kind of discussions were going on. Uh, and I know uh, certainly President Obama did send a, a a sort of reformed AUMF up for Congress to to consider it was pretty weak stuff and pretty far after the fact, frankly. Uh, and I remember asking uh, Secretary Mattis in a Defense Appropriations Subcommittee hearing in 2017, did he need a new AUMF? And he said, yes, we absolutely do need a new AUMF. Uh, you know, and uh, of course, we never got uh, uh, that request formally from the administration. Uh, so inside your the respective administrations you were with, how serious was the consideration ever given to saying, hey, we've got an AUMF that we are stretching uh, beyond belief. Uh, we need to go ask Congress to do something new. Anybody ever seriously put that question to a president and, and how did different presidents respond? Again, I'm not asking you to violate any confidence or whatever, I'm just curious if this is a debate on one end of Pennsylvania Avenue, is it ever a debate on the other end of Pennsylvania Avenue? And I'm start, I'll start. We had uh, uh, Dr. Ingberg, let me go with you. So the way this came up for me historically um, was in the context of decisions about uh, who could be detained at Guantanamo and the extent to which those individuals actually fell within the AUMF. And so there was, um, a, you know, this this has been widely reported that there was a, um, a lot of interagency disagreement um, during those years over the extent to which the AUMF, what, what individuals were covered by the AUMF and the extent to which um, those um, uh, those individuals should be covered by the AUMF. And interestingly, um, in particular, in the in the the way this came this arose in the early years of the Obama administration, and I should say I worked on these issues under both the Bush and the Obama administrations, but they really came to a head 
under the Obama administration because of all of the litigation that was underway. And so the way these these legal questions came to a head, you know, you have the Obama administration come in, and as a as a career civil servant, I was able to watch all of this sort of happen, this transition. And individuals come in, and they um, on the first you know first few days in office, the the Obama administration um, made these executive orders about closing Guantanamo and established a task force. And this was going to be a reasoned process of decision making about who could be detained and about what the AUMF meant and who it covered, et cetera. Um, but the reality of what happened at that time is that all of that decision making got channeled into a litigation driven process because we were in the midst of active litigation over all the Guantanamo detainees. And so the decisions about how to interpret the AUMF during that, those early years of the Obama administration came about primarily through litigation where all the influences are, all the institutional biases are to project a defensive view of executive branch power because you're in defensive litigation before a court um, you are you are in a position where you are institute where DOJ's litigators are running the questions and they are institutionally set up to defend the president's power to do whatever is before the court in that case defend any given individual and so all of the institutional biases in that moment are geared towards saying the president has the power to do X Y Z and anything that the right that is before the court in that moment and so that is how a lot of decisions end up getting made um, particularly when these decisions are are um, in the in the in the course of defensive litigation inside the executive branch, and so I don't know that you can look at from the outside and think that every decision that the executive branch makes is the result of sort of a reasoned, deliberative, forward-looking process. We want to have this authority going forward, rather than sometimes a backward-looking process. We're just defending decisions that have already been made. Thank you, Mr. Is there ever any consideration in the Bush years of of saying, "Hey, we got it wrong in 2001," or 2002, we need something different, or we need to look at the War Powers Act, or we sort of caught up always and uh, we've made these decisions, now we have to defend them. Well, by, of course, this was 10 years ago rather than more recently. Uh, so we had eight years of practice under the 2001 AUMF, and it had, by the end of the Bush administration, even then, it was getting to be outdated. Uh, uh, I was in the Situation Room and spent hundreds and hundreds of hours, uh, particularly in the second term, debating whether particular terrorist groups were either the same as, affiliated with, associated with, or somehow had ties with the people who had committed the 9-11 attacks. So in 2000. Two, three, four, five, it was easier, but as it got to be seven, eight, uh, it was getting harder. And I literally, we would spend hours debating well, if, is this group really the same as the group that Congress gave us the authority to use force on? And then, of course, it just got worse for the next 10 years. The, the ISIS example that you gave, I think, is useful both legally and politically. I think Dr. Bridgman may have been in the White House at the time. The Obama administration actually reached out to me, even though I was out, to see if I would support what they were doing. I think their preference in 2014 would have been to get a new congressional authorization. Of course, any president would prefer to have authorization. But as you well know, at the time the president asked, it was July, August of an election year. And I think, you know, I'm reluctant to get into politics, but very difficult to pull 535 members back in August of an election year to vote a new authorization to use military force. So ultimately, the Obama administration used the really pretty legally strained argument that ISIS was really the same group that Congress had authorized back in 2001. And that was a stretch because, in fact, Al Qaeda had essentially divorced itself from ISIS. My sense, again, you all can tell me, was Congress didn't actually disagree as a policy matter with what President Obama wanted to do. Uh, 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 Mr. Cole, I think you said you supported that, but it just would have been very difficult to drag Congress back for a vote uh, to vote that new authorization. So, yes, to answer your question, particularly as these laws have gotten further and further dated, there is a good deal of debate inside the executive branch. That's, I'm sure, why Secretary Mattis said to you, in theory, yes, I would love to have a new AUMF if you will give me 
the right AUMF. Absolutely. Uh, Dr. Bridgman, same and question. Yeah, I think it's a really important question, and I just want to give you two uh, quick concrete examples. Um, the first, and I was still at the State Department at this time, was when President Obama decided to come to Congress uh, with respect to the, the possibility of striking Assad in Syria in response to chemical weapons use. And he said he had authority under Article 2 of the Constitution to take those strikes. I, I think that that is a stretch. Um, but he also said that in the absence of a direct or imminent threat to our security, it is right to take this to Congress. He said that our democracy is stronger when the president acts with the support of Congress and America acts more effectively abroad when we stand together. Now, I think that latter part of the statement is absolutely correct. Uh, but in claiming that he had Article II authority before coming to Congress, I think he undermined his case. I think it implied that coming to Congress is discretionary. And I don't think that's the right way to think about it. So I think uh, it was absolutely right to come to Congress, but doing so with that, I'm going to fall back on authority I already have in my back pocket. It makes it harder, I think, to to seriously be contemplating that Congress must act, um, and it and it kind of keeps the momentum, I think, in the executive branch's court. Um, I think the counter ISIL campaign is an even stronger example of that. Now, uh, I, I believe uh, I, I agree with with what uh, Mr. Bellinger just laid out for you, uh, and but I, I would add to it that I think this this other issue that I just flagged with respect to Syria was was even more important with respect to the, the counter ISIL campaign. Had the president come to Congress and said, "I don't have a statutory authorization for this. The 2001 AUMF was meant to respond to the 9/11 attacks. This is not that group. It's not those countries." It's not that threat. It's a different situation, but let me tell you, Mosul has been overrun. Atrocities are being committed and Baghdad is going to fall unless you help us get there. I think Congress would have acted and I think Congress needed to have that opportunity, but the executive branch doesn't have that trust that Congress will act. And the executive branch sees Baghdad about to fall. So that trust needs to be built back up and it needs to be built back up by Congress being willing to take votes. And Congress voted in, in the Yemen context in 2019. Congress voted in the Iran context in 2020. If Congress keeps that up, and most important, if Congress actually engages in this war powers and AUMF reform that, that this hearing is addressing today, I think the executive branch will no longer have that crutch to say, well, I have this authority in my back pocket. So when I'm coming to you, it's not meaningful meaningfully because I need you. Right, that that's the dynamic that needs to change, and I think Congress taking these steps that we're talking about today is going to start changing that dynamic over time. You, you have to unmute, Tom. You you have to unmute. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to add some some commentary from the other side of the legislative fence. I remember talking to President Obama during the Syrian uh, red line incident and uh, making very much the same points you had, that he'd laid down a red line without asking any of the rest of us. Uh, and uh, nobody supports the use of chemical weapons, but we didn't intervene in Iran when Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons in 1990 against the Kurds. You know, we just did not choose to do that. And there's a big difference uh, between what we were looking at and, and ISIS a couple of years later than what we were looking at in in Syria. But uh, the mere fact that it was an after the fact consultation with Congress, you know, I'm going to do this. I just want your fingerprints on it, but I can do it whether your fingerprints are on it. It just was not a very compelling argument, particularly when I suspect almost everybody's phones were ringing off the wall. Don't do this. We're already involved deeply in the Middle East. Why do we want to go into Syria? where we don't know we might have a humanitarian interest but frankly i don't think we had very compelling strategic interests uh, uh, in that particular outcome but uh, uh, let me just quickly get to one other point and i know there's a lot of interest in this i don't want to take too much time the chairman's been very generous as always uh, all of you put your finger uh you know one way or the other on the key point which is congressional will uh you know at the end of the day this doesn't matter. And the chairman suggested this, and he's absolutely right. It's very difficult when it's a president of your own party. 
Uh, and I've seen people flip, uh, you know, in that regard. The chairman, to his credit, by the way, has been very consistent in his concern on this issue, whether there was a Democrat or a Republican in the, in the White House. I remember on one occasion talking to, uh, when we were engaged in one of these efforts, actually together, talking to Speaker Ryan, who uh, called me and said, you know, I see what you guys are doing, and I'm really afraid uh, that uh, if you continue down this path, we won't have the votes to sustain this particular military operation. I won't get into all of them, which I supported, quite frankly. And I said, well, if we don't have the votes, maybe we shouldn't do it. Uh, you know, even though I would have a different opinion than probably my friend, Mr. McGovern, in that case, uh, would have had. The point is, if you don't have popular consensus and will behind it, it may be the wrong decision, but uh, that's okay. That's how our system works. We don't get every decision right, but we take responsibility are supposed to take responsibility for the decisions we make. And when we're committing men and women to war uh, and committing the country uh, to uh, something that could go on a lot longer and become a lot more difficult, we ought to be willing to step up and do that uh, and uh, and then go home and face the voters and make the case as best we can and leave the decision. A process deficit. Uh, I, I think this is, we've seen this with, for example, uh, treaty hearings in the SFRC. It's, it's a Congress-wide issue, and it's not just related to war powers. If if no one's around who's actually done these before, it be becomes much more, more difficult to do. So part of it is is building up that institutional capacity, and I think this this committee is a model for doing that already. I think other committees are starting to do the same. Uh, in addition to building up that capacity, uh, there I think needs to be a, a, a clear. Uh, sounding board with constituents about the real issues. And I think you may find you're, you're exactly right uh, that you may not agree on the ultimate decision uh, in every single case. But I think we can look our service members and their families in the eye if we say, I'm talking to you about whether we should be doing this. I'm taking these hard decisions about whether to send you into harm's way. And so I want to hear from you about that. I think opening up those kinds of conversations with our constituents is not only what we should be doing for democratic accountability, it's not only the morally right thing to do, I think it's the politically right thing to do. And it will help members be able to say, I've talked to these families. I've talked to these service members that were deployed three times in Afghanistan and two times in Iraq, and I'm listening. So I, I think that will help with the political will as well. And then the thing that I'll say most from the kind of most legalistic and mechanical perspective is having that funds cut off in place. There's nothing like a funds cut off to focus the mind and to force a vote. And if everyone has to vote, if it is a foregone conclusion that a vote must happen, then it's a matter of building up that political will to, to bolster yourself in the event that, 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 that the president comes to you uh, through these other mechanisms I'm describing, but you know it's out there, and so you have to take these steps. You can't sit back and, you know, as Chairman McGovern said, you, you can't hide uh, behind the president. So I think those are some of the, the key things I would highlight. I'm sure there are many others, um, but I would I would encourage those as, as initial steps. Dr. Ridge, I'm going to go to you next, then I'll go to you, uh, Mr. Bellinger. So I agree with Dr. Bridgman. I think there's a bit of a feedback loop here. Um, if you don't have the authority- Oh, Dr. Enberg, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, that's, <laughs> that's fine. I think there's a feedback loop, right? If you don't have the authority, then you're not expected to exercise responsibility over it, and your constituents don't necessarily hold you accountable to it. And so we need to somehow break that feedback loop so that the opposite is true, right? So that um, your constituents are expecting this from you and they are holding you to account for it. Um, and I think that Dr. Bridgman is correct, that one way to do so would be for a funding cut up, which would create um, that kind of required action. Um, and I think that this point about institutional um, expertise is correct. We, I've seen this happen in the executive branch. I've seen it happen in the courts where there was a, an area that had not, they had not previously had expertise. I remember when the courts started taking up, you know, just to bring back the Guantanamo cases again, when the courts started breaking, taking up those cases, there was a sense that this was not their expertise. They didn't know what they were doing and Congress should have given them rules and why are you, you know, and, and why do we have to do this? And yet over the course of many years, they built up extreme expertise in this area simply by doing it. And we've, I've seen this happen inside the executive branch as well. And I have no, and I have total confidence that this would happen in Congress as well. 
Thank you. Let me go to you, Mr. Bellinger, and let me just uh, preface my remark or my question with this remark. I agree very much with the point you made earlier that uh, Congress doesn't need to be involved in every decision. For instance, I would not and was not critical when President Biden made a decision he needed to make a strike in Iraq recently. That was clearly a one-off kind of thing, a, a quick response, I think, very appropriately uh, done under his authority. I know some of my colleagues, uh, frankly, on both sides of the aisle would disagree with that, but I see that as kind of routine exercise of executive authority, very different than something like uh, the deployment uh, against ISIS uh, in the Middle East and, and uh, something, you know, obviously different than the decision to go into Iraq where he really, and, and to be fair, we did have a congressional vote on that. But anyway, your uh, your thoughts on how we bolster congressional will to actually use this authority that the Constitution gives us and hold ourselves responsible. So a couple of things. One, um, actually, I would start small, but realistically this year with something that I, I really do think could be done. I think uh, that uh, there is will in both houses to repeal some of these old U AUMFs like the 2002 AUMF. Uh, you know, we should might as well get rid of the 1991 AUMF as well. Uh, but, you know, the 2002 AUMF in particular, you know, should really not have been relied on as the use as the authority to take a strike against uh, Qasem Soleimani. And I think, you know, I've heard from Republicans and Democrats that, you know, I think that's something you all really could start with this year and get that done. Then it gets harder. Um, uh, going to the other end of the spectrum, uh, the, with the War Powers Resolution, um, you know, this will take some time to work one's way through it. I really do urge you all to look closely at the findings and the uh, draft statute uh, from the National War Powers Commission. That ha they did a lot of testimony uh, uh, Jim Baker, Warren Christopher, Brent Scowcroft, these are very smart people, and they really took into account both the law and the politics of it. And the, the, the draft that they came up with uh, ended these, you know, 60-day cutoffs and, and, and had a, a consultation requirement uh, uh, that they thought was realistic. And then, and you'll have to tell me whether you think this works inside the House and the Senate, but required in the case of any significant use of force, uh, uh, the House and the Senate to vote within 30 days uh, uh, authorizing that use of force. So uh, forcing each House to have a vote. Uh, and if they voted it up, then the use of force was authorized. If they didn't vote it up, then there would be a requirement uh, for that any member could put forward uh, to vote it down. Now that would not end the use of force, but it would put Congress immediately on the record one way or the other. So I thought the National War Powers Commission struck the appropriate balance. I don't disagree academically with things like a funding cutoff, uh, but I just honestly, I, I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I think Congress could not come to agree on those, and I think it would be vetoed by a president of either party. Uh, uh, it, neither a Republican or a Democratic president is going to uh, vote in favor of a law that says that you can cut off my uh, uh, authority to use force. So I guess my, my recommendation to you today is to, to be realistic about taking back uh, a, a congressional power. I agree with the things that both you and the chairman have said about what has happened, uh, but uh, I don't think Congress can claw back all the power that has been ceded to uh, presidents over the last 30 or 40 years. Well, that's a very thoughtful answer. And uh, to your point, I remember when the majority flipped in 2007, 2006, but effectively 2007, uh, there certainly weren't the votes to uh, defund the effort in Iraq, even though power changed because the president would have vetoed that and it would have been sustained and everybody in both houses knew it. We went through a big exercise a big debate where everybody spent five minutes on the floor saying where they stood uh, but uh, effectively there was no 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 ability to end that conflict at that point without presidential uh, consent so with that mr chairman i want to yield back to you uh, but again i want to thank you very much uh, for this hearing i want to thank our witnesses and i particularly want to uh, work with you as we go so that we actually do something 
legislatively, and uh, certainly these smaller steps, I think, are very much within reach, maybe something more robust as well. As you said, we, we have an unusual opening in that we have an administration that actually wants to work with us rather than, than work against Congress as an institution in doing this and doing it the right way. And uh, shame on us if we miss the opportunity uh, to, uh, to actually, uh, uh, you know, reclaim our authority when we actually have uh, an administration that wants to help us get that done so we get a better balance than we've had over the last generation. With that, I yield back to my friend. Well, thank you. I thank the gentleman, and I, and I look forward to working with him as we try to figure out how, how best uh, to move forward here. Uh, at this time, I want to ask unanimous consent to add a letter signed by 20 nonprofit organizations from across the political spectrum supporting our hearing today and the effort to reform the War Powers Resolution. The letter says, in part, that the undersigned organizations are calling on Congress to restore the balance of national security powers, including war powers between the legislative and executive branches of government. We are committed to working with you to build on the momentum created by this hearing and to pursuing the reforms we hope will follow. And so without objection, I'll put that on the record. I'm now happy to yield to Mrs. Torres. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't want to take um, you know, a lot of time. I, just uh, uh, a short statement. Um, I want to do associate myself with your comments and the comments of the ranking member. I think it's appropriate uh, during this time, and I want to take an opportunity also to thank our esteemed um, panel that is with us um, today, helping to guide this conversation. Um, I hate to be the skunk in this party. Um, you know, but I'm very concerned as to where um, the politics of, you know, this Congress um, is uh, currently. Um, if we cannot even, you know, agree on certifying a national election that had already been certified um, by, you know, all of our states, um, I'm not sure, you know, where we could be if they could could be an agreement moving forward. I appreciate the idea of baby steps um, to get us, you know, back to working together on national security issues. Um, maybe that is a way to get us, um, you know, to a, you know, more nonpartisan um, place. But, um, you know, from where I stand, uh, weighing in what, you know, I've been experiencing, you know, in this Congress uh, just this year, I think it's gonna be a very, very difficult um, um, place, um, you know, to, to work on recalling the authority of Congress. Um, more than anything, I would love to have, you know, a way to be able to be more transparent and accountable to my constituents when they come to me after or, um, a loss of, you know, a son or a daughter that has been serving their country abroad. Um, how do I, um, you know, be more, how can I be more transparent and accountable when we're spending, you know, billions and billions and trillions of dollars in funding, um, you know, wars that have just gone on, you know, for much too long? You know, those are some real concerns um, that I have as a member of Congress, the inability to be able to um, um, share um, some of that with my constituents. I'm also concerned um, that many of our staffs um, do not have um, the proper um, certifications to be able to get just basic information um, on these um, on these wars, on these issues moving forward. So those are just some of my concerns. Um, I want to turn it back over to the chairman. I know that we've spent a lot of time on this already, and I just hope that um, you know we'll continue this conversation and, and that we are mindful of where we are politically, the reality, you know, the the dark reality of that as we move forward. Um, but thank you again for this hearing, and I yield back. Thank you, uh, Dr. Burgess. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Thanks for uh, you and Mr. Cole for holding this hearing. I know we've had a number of discussions about this over the years with both uh, both parties in in power. Um, Mr. Bellinger, I you know as we've thought through this in the past, uh, and the question always comes up. I mean, as we're now on the I guess the 20th anniversary 
of the uh, of the 2001 authorization, and it's basically still in effect. Is a sunset on an AUMF a good idea? And if it is, how do you avoid having that sunset date not just be the uh, basically the battle plan of your adversaries? Yeah, it's a great question that I have grappled with. And I have to say, candidly, uh, uh, Dr. Burgess, that I'm, my own position has moved on this. Uh, you know, as a purely executive branch lawyer and a lawyer sort of for the military and the president, I would rather not have a sunset in that, you know, what what president wants to say, I, I've only got authority for a year or two years or three years. And you know, what's going to happen after that? And what sort of a signal does that send to the other side that, well, we're only in this for a couple of years? Or what does that, what does that send to our military that, well, Congress is in only for a penny, but not for a pound? You know, as I said, I was involved in the drafting of the 2001 AUMF. You know, the, the World Trade Center and the Pentagon were still smoldering at the time it was being drafted. You know, we we would not have accepted an AUMF at the time if Congress had said, well, we're going to give you a year's worth of authority and then we'll see how it goes. Um, so that's kind of my general position. But 20 years later now, seeing just how much the 2001 AUMF has been had stretched and how difficult it is, and I appreciate the difficult position you all are in, to vote on something that might go on for another 20 years, you know, what's passed as prologue, I could come to that compromise and say, look, if the if the price of a new revised AUMF is a sunset, um, you know, let's maybe do it for three years or five years, then with some sort of expedited procedure, though, that would require Congress to rapidly act on it. So is a sunset a great idea? You know, no. But I I don't do politics the way you all do politics, but I understand that that, you know, it's difficult for you to vote on a a new AUMF after the last one's gone on for 20 years. So if I were in the president's shoes, would I recommend that he agree to a sunset for you know three to five more years on a new AUMF? Yes, I would do that. So you know it's interesting on the entire rules committee. I guess the uh, chairman McGovern and Elsie Hastings were the only two members of Congress who were here when the the two AUMFs that we currently have now were voted on. Mr. Cole and I came in the following year, so uh, most of us in Congress have never have never voted on an AUMF and and really have not had to wrestle with what the implications were before before casting that vote. And I have felt over the years that it would be useful that from time to time we would revisit our commitment. But I also spent some time uh, researching the um the conclusion of the vietnam war and the cooper church amendment and the efforts to suspend funding during the nixon administration for the vietnam war and although obviously i was not in congress at that time when i came to congress we had a colleague ron simmons from connecticut who had served in vietnam and i will never forget his poignant speech that he gave on the house floor when uh, uh consideration was being made for for military cuts uh and he described how as a young soldier in the field in vietnam his visceral and continued hatred for the united states congress for sending him there and then cutting him off and you can just imagine that uh, that is multiplied many many times by the uh, the men and women that we've asked to go into harm's way on our behalf so that, that's a lesson i've never forgotten and Although I do think that members who've never had to vote on an AUMF should from time to time need to revisit that before it's continued. I also am sensitive to the fact that the, uh, the, the downrange folks are really very much the ones we put in harm's way. And they're the ones who are going to be so desperately affected by uh, what, what might be a perfectly arbitrary or academic uh, funding lapse. And Ms. Bellinger, I, I don't know if you had any thoughts on that. I'll simply say I, I agree with the points that you have made on both sides. I mean, as I say, in, in general, I don't think it sends a good signal to the troops to say, you know, we're only going to extend for three more years. On the other hand, 
the 2001 AUMF has gotten so long, old and stretched and really doesn't uh, apply so much to modern terrorist groups that you know, if, if that's what it takes to, uh, to get a new three-year authorization, I think the only thing I would add on, and, and, and you all have, are better at the procedure than I am, is to guarantee that if there is, a say, a three-year sunset or a five-year sunset, that there would then be a rapid process to uh, uh, to look at it again, uh, uh, so that there's essentially a safety net. Yeah, and, and uh, I also appreciate the fact you've used the word uh, flexibility several times this morning, and uh, I think the term also came up a variety of purposes. Um, when we look at, uh, at perhaps future future activities in the authorization for use of military force are, uh, do you think we're flexible enough to incorporate cyber attacks into those AUMFs? Oh boy, that's a tough one. Uh, you know, certainly, uh, certainly against the terrorist groups that committed the 9-11 attacks or people who were associated or affiliated with them, yes, if we, uh, you know, we we there is authority which Congress has granted for us to you know, take down a uh, a Al Qaeda uh, 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 cyber infrastructure or modern groups associated with them. But it's not it's not the the 2001 AUMF. While very very broad, many countries any kind of use of force, no sunset. It is still tied to the nations, individuals, or groups that committed or responsible for the 9-11 attack. So it's not general cyber authority. Uh, so uh, I think to have a, a broader AUMF that gave the president broader authority to use cyber against other targets, that would be very, very difficult to do. That, I would say, probably best left inherent to the president's uh, uh, Article II authorities. And not and not as part of uh, the Congress and only having oversight after the fact. And oh, well, certainly a consultation. I'm very much in favor of consultation. And again, back to uh, my uh, recommendation to look at the National War Powers Commission report, which was all about consultation before the fact, during the fact, and afterwards. You know, I do think that if the executive were to be planning some significant cyber attack uh, uh, that they ought to be uh, that they ought to be uh, consulting with Congress. Yeah, of course, the big worry is uh, the, the greatest risk going forward may be a may be a cyber risk. And uh, I don't feel that we're completely prepared to handle that if and when it does occur. But I, I thank everyone for being Part of this uh, discussion today, Mr. Chairman, Frank and Cole, thank you for for bringing it up, and I'm going to yield back in the interest of time. Thank you. I I don't know. Was Professor Ingbar, were you trying to get our attention, or? Yeah, I just wanted to um to respond to that. I I, I really agree with Mr. Bellinger that we need to think about this question of sunsets in terms. Of, of not just the power that you're authorizing the president to use right now, but also how these statutes could be read 20 years from now. Um, and so I just wanted to, to clarify that, to, in particular to Representative Burgess's concern, that a sunset is not a sunset for the United States in using force. It's a sunset for the executive branch's use of force before returning to Congress. And so there is nothing stopping the president from continuing to engage Congress. There's nothing nothing saying the president should just wait until the end of that two year sunset, or, right? And then go back to Congress and leave a gap in the conflict. This is an incentive for the president to be continuously engaging Congress and to work with Congress. And if the Congress and the president together foresee that that conflict is not going to be over, that is an opportunity for them to engage prior to the end of that sunset, right? And so it's, it is, you know, this is not about the United States' use of force in any particular conflict. It's about who inside the United States is making these decisions and whether or not there's a role for Congress in doing so. I, Dr. Bridgman. Yeah, just uh, really briefly, one quick point that I think might be helpful also to keep in mind on the sunset issue is that uh, with respect to this signal that we're sending to service members, I think one other way to look at it, which is an alternative view, is that if 
have the courage to fight. We have the courage to vote. And we're going to come in behind you and support you. And we're going to show every two years, every three years, that we believe you should still be there, that we're going to authorize you to be there and appropriate for you to be there and provide what you need, both when you're deployed and when you come home. So that's that's the other way that I would think about that. And very briefly with respect to cyber, I think it could be helpful to think about it uh, in, in two different ways. One is when you're authorizing a use of force, you, you generally would think about authorizing force against particular enemies, but not choosing the means by which you fight those enemies. Um, at least that's been the case since the 1700s when, when Congress did used to actually say you can only fight this much war. Uh, now, generally, Congress says you can fight within the law of armed conflict as much as you need, uh, and that can include cyber weapons. That can include uh, whatever means are uh, appropriate that the commander in chief feels need to be used um, so long as they're within the limits of the law of armed conflict. The, the separate question, though, is whether cyber needs to be taken into account in war powers reform. And that's something that I think has been tricky as the executive branch has interpreted hostilities so narrowly in that context that a good range of, of cyber attacks wouldn't qualify as hostilities. Um, so that's something that I encourage you to, to keep in mind when you're looking at a new, a new definition of hostilities in the war powers uh, reform context is, is specifying that hostilities can include, uh, you know, intermittent engagements, engagements that are at low intensity and engagements that are, uh, that are uh, using force from remote weapon systems like cyber weapons or like drones. And I think it is important to, to keep that uh, at the forefront when you're thinking about the definition of hostilities. Thank you very much. And um, and I want to say for the record, even though Dr. Burgess pointed out that I was like one of the few people that was here when the uh, authorizations uh, for the use of military force were voted on, that does not mean I'm the oldest person on this committee. No, um, I'm not meaning to infer uh, that at all, Chairman. Okay, and um, and I just uh, and I and I also, you know, and I just want to say that um, you know, uh, I I voted for um, the use of military force uh, in Afghanistan after 9/11. I thought at the, way back when I thought it was the appropriate thing to do and. Uh, to to respond to go after those who are responsible for what happened uh, in New York and at the Pentagon and in Pennsylvania, um, but I will tell you to be very uh, uh, very honest with you, um, I look as I look back on that vote now, I'm not sure I would do it again um, because I never thought that 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 could be um, twisted and interpreted in so many different ways, and quite frankly. That our mission in Afghanistan could change so dramatically over a period of time without coming back to Congress and getting and having a debate and and having um, you know a Congress vote on it. I voted against the use authorization use of military force uh, in Iraq um, uh, in part because I you know I was afraid where it would lead. Um, but let me just say this: I, I do think that it is uh, that, that there are cases where the United States can stumble into wars that are mistaken wars, but are the wrong wars. And we need to have a mechanism to be able to correct it, uh, if that's the case. And I agree with Dr. Bridgman, you know, I, um, you know, just because you uh, start a war, you may, it, it may be the wrong war, but I can't think of anything more offensive in terms of respecting our troops than to keep them in a war that uh, is mistaken. Um, and so, you know, I, I remember I visited Afghanistan a, a couple of years ago, and I was visiting with some uh, troops from Massachusetts. And I remember uh, a, a very candid conversation uh, with with, with um, one of our uh, men who was deployed over there, who said, "Do you people in Congress even know what the hell's going on over here? I mean, when's the last time you debated uh, what our policy is here? Uh, I mean, do you know what the reality is here?" And, um, you know, it occurred to me that his frustration was the fact that um, we, we, do, we do very little oversight um, and debate on, on a conflict that, that continues to this day. Um, and a lot, of, a lot of our troops, you listen to our troops, they have some very strong opinions about whether or not we should remain there or whether we should come home. But it seems to me, um, if they have, it, you know, they have the courage to go into our armed forces and to be deployed in harm's way, we ought to have the courage to be able to debate these issues. And 
I go back to what you know, and Mr. Cole alluded to this as well. I mean, part of this problem is the executive branch wanting to take as much power as it can possibly get and uh, to have as much control over these matters as possible. Part of the problem is us. Um, you know, the fact that there are people on both sides of the aisle who would like nothing more than to avoid these discussions and these debates and these votes, because when you vote, you are held accountable. Uh, and um, and so, you know, there is this this what I call moral cowardice that exists and has existed for some time where we have tried to dodge these very difficult issues. But hopefully we are we are moving beyond that. And at this point, I want to yield to Mr. Raskin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, thanks to um, well to you and to the ranking member for your uh, excellent leadership in framing this discussion. And thanks to the, the witnesses who've done such a great job. I wanted to go back to something that Professor uh, Ingber started off with um, when she said that none of us can really answer the question anymore um, who we're at war with or whether indeed we're in war at all. Uh, who are, you know, whether we're at war and against whom. Um, and um, the, the character of war has clearly changed in a whole bunch of ways. Um, it's changed in terms of the identity of the enemies. And, um, you know, I think most people would probably answer the question, who are we at war with today with an abstract noun, like we're at war with terror, or we're at war with terrorism, um, or we're at war with extremism, or something like that. And I wonder, let me just to start off with you, Professor Ingber, like, to what extent is it a problem to think of war as being not against particular foreign governments, hostile governments with whom we're at odds, um, and instead to think of war as as kind of crusades against problems in the world, whether it's, you know, terrorism or evil or extremism or, um, you know, Islamic fundamentalism or communism or whatever it might be. So I think that it's it's worth thinking historically a little bit about what happened in the immediate aftermath after 2001, after the 9-11 attacks. Um, the, the immediate instincts of the executive branch at that time were to go to Congress to ask for that kind of all-encompassing authority, just the, the ability to use force against all future threats, um, which you know, looked a little bit like a war on terrorism writ large. And Congress, even in the immediate aftermath of 9-11, had the foresight to tie their authority instead, to refuse that expansive authority to the president, and then tie their authority instead to the specific attacks of 9-11, which were so extreme, and to using force against the organizations that had committed those attacks. And so that, so we are not, in any legal sense of the term, involved in a war on, on some kind of ideology or a war on terrorism at large. But nevertheless, when I say that we can't identify the, the particular wars that we are involved in, I say that because there is a lot of um, legal interpretation that goes on to this day to figure to, to answer those questions. And so you will have, when I say that even executive branch um, officials might not necessarily be able to answer that question, it's because they don't necessarily answer that question until they absolutely have to answer that question because they're asked it. And so we might be using force against an entity, but not calling that an armed conflict. We might be um, we might be using force in a particular state and not consider ourselves to be at war with that state based on the way we've interpreted the executive branch has interpreted these legal authorities. But because there is not the transparency that comes with having to present the case to Congress and then work this out through consultation with Congress, through testimony executive from executive branch officials, from members of Congress demanding that the executive branch both make the case for why we need to use force in this particular instance, and also make the case for how we're going to get out of this, right? What we see is the end game. Um, we, the American people don't have insight into that process, and members of Congress don't have insight into that process, and even the very executive officials 
prosecuting these conflicts don't necessarily have to answer that question and so ne wouldn't necessarily have the answer to that question unless asked to provide it and, and, to, and uh, create it. Well, um, th that leads me to Mr. Bellinger, who, who described um, in the process several years after the original authorization of use of military force, trying to determine whether this group or that group actually came within the designation, um, which sounds a little bit like a, a bureaucratic delegation of the decision whether or not to go to war or be at war against a particular group. Uh, based on your interpretation or your classification that there is something to me kind of orwellian about the idea that um you know the executive branch or uh, officials within it can just decide this is a group that we're going to be at war against and this one's not based on an interpretation and i'm wondering uh, mr bellinger what you think the solution to that problem is in order, in order to have Congress really stay in the driver's seat. So let me answer that. And I, I do want to just go back to the 2001 period. Um, uh, in, I was in the White House in the whole period from February 2001 to September 2001, as we were watching these threats gather in Afghanistan. And of course, uh, you know, then we had 9-11 attacks and there was a whole 9-11 commission uh, on why didn't President Bush prevent the attacks from happening? Shouldn't he have attacked Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan at the time? Uh, and, you know, that was one reason why the use of force authority that was sought in uh, 2001, when we really didn't know who had been responsible for the attacks, we didn't know in the time that we asked Congress for the authorization, whether it was Al Qaeda or some other group and whether they were plotting other attacks. So uh, the country was reeling uh, and the president asked for as broad authority as possible, uh, not against all terrorists, but against terrorists who were planning attacks against the United States. And so to answer your question, Mr. Raskin, as these groups then began to splinter and morph and there became you know, Al-Shabaab and uh, uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Al-Qaeda in Somalia, and they were all talking to each other and sharing information with each other. Uh, and the uh, uh, as we saw the groups change, and of course, this is what President Obama did 13 years later with respect to ISIS. Uh, now, in that case, I think it was too much of a stretch to say that ISIS really was the same group as Al Qaeda when they weren't. But for the years in the Bush administration, as we saw Al Qaeda begin to splinter and as they were driven out of Afghanistan into other countries, uh, it, it was appropriate to determine whether these other groups were in fact uh, continuing to plan attacks against the United States. So let me just end up here with what to do about the 2001 AUMF, because I think Congress now has three choices. We can either muddle through where we have been for the last 20 years with this old 20 year, and this is, I think, what you're getting at, Mr. Askin, is you know it, the groups that threaten us today, which undoubtedly are, are not the same groups that committed the 9-11 attacks 20 years ago. So, do we continue to muddle through and keep stretching this further and further? Do we repeal it altogether, in which case Congress clearly knows that President Biden will use force against terrorists that attack us? So do we simply ask President Biden to rely on his Article II authorities? And that's not good either. Or do we revise and replace the 2001 AUMF to authorize President Biden to use force against the groups that threaten us today. So those are the three choices. Mm. Okay, and finally, I've got a question for you, um, Dr. Bridgman, um, which is you describe um, a situation where we have legitimate wars that are declared by Congress. We have those that have not been declared, but are legitimate defensive actions taken by the president in an emergency type situation. But then 
in the real world today, there's a whole spectrum of other kinds of military actions or hostilities that are engaged in and so on. To, to what extent was that part of the original constitutional design, that third category of things, which are neither unilateral executive, uh, executive action under Article 2, nor declared wars, but just kind of twilight hostilities that are taking place where, you know, we, we you know, we, we, we send, we, we bomb somebody one day and we call it a day. Um, you know, we engage w with different nations in different ways. I mean, in other words, if we, I guess what I'm getting at is if we license that third category, I don't know that we're really going to be able to deal with this problem. I, I agree with you. I don't think Congress should license that third category as a blank check. I don't think we should see it just as, as one simple category. Each, each threat uh, and each uh, use of force that's not in response to a threat is a very specific factual circumstance that, that needs to be taken on its own terms. Um, when you look back historically, your question started with the Constitution. Uh, there weren't really three categories. There were two categories. There were those immediate and sudden attacks on the United States that the president had to repel, and potentially also this ability to rescue U.S. nationals abroad who were in peril. Um, I think those are considered core. I think those should be uncontroversial. I think the president needs the authority to respond in those two instances. And I think if you look at the vast majority of instances uh, and, and over half of the War Powers reports indicating hostilities that have been filed since its enactment have been those kinds of things, have been the, the embassy evacuation, the hostage rescue, the, the response to a threat. Um, I think the category that you're talking about, it's, it's actually two different kinds of things. It's the humanitarian operations, the stabilization missions, the, the advise and assist missions. Those are the things that the Constitution absolutely envisioned Congress would authorize if we were to engage in them. Um, if we were to come to the defense of an ally, for example, when the United States itself was not under threat. Uh, but they're also the, the kinds of things that I, that I think you're getting at uh, are these one off or low intensity strikes where we're not in, in full blown war, where Congress hasn't authorized it and where the president is using Article 2 authority or sometimes stretching an existing AUMF uh, to claim the authority to act. And I think that's where we have to change our overall mindset about whether force is always the appropriate response when a group is not directly threatening the United States when they don't have the ability to launch an attack that would uh, harm the United States or our nationals. I think we need to take a much harder look and say, is the answer to that low level threat a low level use of force? Or is the answer to that low level threat that, that we employ the other tools in our toolbox absolutely necessary in our self-defense? Or when Congress decides that yes, this is in our vital national security interests, or yes, this is something that we need to do uh, with coalition partners uh, because it's imperative to our foreign policy. It's it's imperative for humanitarian reasons, et cetera. Um, so I think in a new AUMF, if there is a new AUMF, I do think it should explicitly preclude the use uh, the use of that uh, authority against groups or countries that are not named in that AUMF. But I think it should go one step further as well. I think it should drop groups that are no longer a threat. And I think you can do this by requiring, say, every six months uh, that the, the ODNI, along with the secretaries of defense and state, certify whether a group still poses a threat to the United States, to our nationals, to our vital interests. If it does not, then the group is dropped from the AOMF if that certification can't be made, for example. So even if we do want to cover some of these smaller uh, you know, groups where we may we may not need to be at war for you know a, a period of time, but we think the president needs the authority to be able to use force in this kind of lower intensity or sh or shorter time period. Then those could could be covered as long as there's sub subsequently a mechanism to drop them if they don't actually threaten us. So I think we just need to keep our eye on: mm -hmm. is it a threat that is actually uh, you know? Uh, vital to our interests? Is it a threat to the United States? Is it a threat to, to U.S. persons? If it is not, I think we need to use some of these other tools rather than just letting the president use force um, in, in, a, in a blank check.
Okay, and then finally, did, do you think that acts of cyber war should be treated in the same way as acts of war? Or is that a, a different level that doesn't? Absolutely should be, be treated in the same way, yes. I, I, I think the, the key question uh, isn't what means are used in, in war. Uh, the question is, has there been an attack or is there an imminent threat of attack on the United States or our nationals? It doesn't matter if that threat is by cyber means uh, or by conventional weapons. Uh, likewise, in our responses, we could be attacked with a cruise missile and choose to respond with a cyber weapon. There, there, there need be no, no symmetry um, in, in the means that are used so long as they're lawful within, within the law of armed conflict. So I think we should think about cyber as just another type of weapon. It's a type of weapon that can be used remotely. It's a type of weapon that sometimes uh, its use can be concealed. Uh, but those are things that the military deals with. Uh, this, this actually isn't, isn't a new phenomenon. We've had developments in weapon systems over you know, thousands of years. Uh, so we need to think about it uh, in terms of ensuring that the executive branch is, is taking it into account in the definition of hostilities, as, as I referenced before. Uh, but I don't think the rules that then apply should be any different. If anything, I think we've seen uh, states come together and say, we need, to, we need to treat cyber weapons like weapons and apply the law of armed conflict uh, when they're used. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you back. very much. Before I yield to Mr. Rochethal, I just want to ask unanimous consent to add a letter from our colleague, Representative Barbara Lee, to the record. Uh, the letter says, in part, Congress has passed due for a reexamination of our security needs and authorities to determine whether we are directing our efforts and resources in ways that truly make Americans more secure. We have a responsibility to not only reexamine current legal authorities, but also the efficacy of the military first approach of our foreign policy of the last two decades. Uh, Congresswoman Lee continues by calling for passage of H.R. 256, which would repeal the 2002 AUMF and provides a framework for Congress to work with President Biden to address the 2001 AUMF. And as my colleagues know, for decades, um, uh, for two last two decades, Congresswoman Lee has been a uh, the moral center of issues of war and peace. And uh, for too long, she's been there alone, and I'm proud to stand with her today. And I thank her for her unyielding commitment to peace. And I now yield to Mr. Reschenthaler. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate you and Ranking Member Cole holding this hearing and all the witnesses for their testimony. And as always, I associate my remarks with uh, Ranking Member Cole's. Uh, with that said, I'm coming to this discussion uh, from, from a unique vantage point uh, with some of my colleagues. I actually deployed to Baghdad in 2009 and prosecuted terrorists in the Central Criminal Court of Iraq. So it was interesting. I was prosecuting terrorists with uh, with an interpreter in the uh, Iraqi court system. And one of my big takeaways was that uh, we're naive if we think that terrorists cannot, um, cannot extend influence to the United States and our allies in Europe and, uh, and elsewhere, particularly Israel. So with, with that said, Mr. Uh, Bellinger, I just wanted to um, I just wanted to uh, look at what you said about the 2001 AUMF. So to paraphrase, to paraphrase you, and I'm going to yield to you in just a second. You said really we have three options. You said one, we can just muddle through it and just just use what we have and and, and try to just get by the best we could. Two, we could just revise it and then we could fall back to uh, Article Two powers and see where that falls. I, I think then option three was we could repeal and replace it. If we did take that third option, what could we put in the replacement that would make sure that we can rapidly act uh, to address terrorist threats, whether it be Al Qaeda, ISIS, or another uh, another iteration of, a, of an Islamic extremist outfit? And with that, I'll yield to you, Mr. Bellinger. Well, fantastic question. And those are the devil ends in the details. And I have now testified, I think, three times before Senator Tim Kaine. Uh, and the Senate side, and he has been working very hard uh, to come up with a bipartisan uh, authorization that is neither too broad nor too narrow. Uh, and, and I know there's been work on the House as well, but I, I, I simply mentioned Senator Kane because he's worked so hard at it. Uh, and, you know, the difficulty to touch on a couple of things that we've already covered is, you know, if you just try to name particular groups, uh, 
then, you know, I see you nodding your head before I've even said it, they'll just change their names. Uh, or they or they morph and become a new group. Uh, you know, we've looked at that. And I think, you know, at one point there were bills that said, okay, uh, uh, authorization can now be used against Al Qaeda, period. Or let's come up with seven different groups. But, you know, things change, groups move, new groups come along that, that want to use force against uh, the United States. So uh, it's very difficult. You know, in theory, we want to give the president the authority to use force against the terrorist groups that are actually planning attacks against the United States. Uh, and so how do you, you could try to name them geographically, you could try to name them uh, by saying, or a group associated, affiliated, or, or that is sharing the resources with, uh, we really worked hard to try to come up with those definitions. Uh, and uh, my belief is that it really, if we want to have Congress on record as authorizing the use of force against the groups that are threatening us every day, that there needs to be a new authorization, or otherwise we're just leaving it up to the president to, under his Article Two powers, and I think as, as uh, Chairman McGovern said, you know, then if, if we like what he did, you know, we'll support it. And if we don't like what he did, then we'll criticize it later. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we need to try to come up and, and, and it really is very difficult to come up with those details, because if you if it's too narrow and it's just, you know, these three groups, then they'll just change. If you do these two countries, they'll move to other countries. But I get it. If you try to describe the threat too broadly, I think this is what Mr. Raskin was getting at you know, to try to authorize the use of force against all terrorists who threaten the United States anywhere, that's obviously too broad. Right, I mean, it's absolutely uh, maddening. Uh, Mr. Bellinger, just to, just to shift gears, um, you know, we're also, uh, as a military, we're involved in stabilization, peacekeeping efforts. I think for a period of time when I was in the Navy, we said the U.S. Navy, a force for good, right? So it's just, be, it's just beyond killing people and breaking things as bluntly uh, as some people describe the military. So with our peacekeeping stabil stabilization uh, missions around the world, what can we do to um, uh, frame future uh, AUMFs, or do you even think we need future AUMFs for uh, these kind of missions? Do you, do you have any thoughts on this particular uh, facet of the military? So let me first by one, Thank you for the, your service. I learned so much from my time in the White House, the State Department, from all the military services that I worked with. I actually come from an Army family, but the, the Navy uh, bore a lot of the brunt on uh, the difficult legal issues. I certainly learned a lot about the laws of war from the Army, Navy, and Air Force JAG. So thank you for that. your personal service and the service of all of those uh, who I worked with. Um, the uh, so this actually does get to something I'd like to like to discuss. I, as as I think Mr. Cole said earlier, agreeing with me, and I'll go back to agreeing with him. I do think the president does ha have and needs broader authority than uh, under Article Two than just to act to either uh, response to an imminent threat, repel an imminent threat, or rescue people. Presidents have historically, just as you said. Uh, really without that much disagreement, uh, engaged in humanitarian missions, uh, engaged in uh, uh, rescue missions for uh, other nationals of other countries. So President Bush 41 uh, authorized the use of force uh, in our humanitarian crisis in Somalia, uh, President Clinton in Haiti. I, I think pres the president as chief executive and commander in chief has authority to to deploy the armed forces in that way in the national interest. Congress has historically not wanted to vote on each one of those missions. I don't think uh, they should. Uh, I mean, just to give one example, a hypothetical, let's assume let's assume a group of British tourists are uh, are caught up on a Caribbean island or somewhere in Africa and are threatened by terrorists. Uh, that doesn't fall within the narrow category of things that my colleagues have said are only inherent in the president's power. Uh, I don't think Congress, though, is going to want to get together to have to pass an authorization to use force 
to authorize the president to engage in that mission. So, you know, bottom line, I certainly get that that Congress has a very definite role in authorizing the upper end of war powers, significant war powers. But I also see that the president of either party has a pretty broad authority to uh, use force in the national interest, as long as it's not getting us into a significant war. We, along the same uh, along the same lines, do you feel the same way about covert actions? For example, some of these covert actions could clearly lead to larger engagements, but we but we have to take them. And there's been numerous examples of that. Um, do, do you want to just briefly touch upon your thoughts on covert actions? Well, of course, intelligence covert actions are governed by you know separate statutory authorities that are reported to the intelligence committees. And I think you're probably referring to sort of military special activities actions. Uh, and in general, I believe those are going to be reported uh, under the War Powers Resolution in a classified briefing if it is in fact troops that are uh, deployed with the significant likelihood that they're going to get into hostilities. And you therefore put your finger on, frankly, one of the problems in the War Powers Resolution is the 48-hour reporting requirement for troops into hostilities. Now, you know, we are seeing more recently presidents relying more and more on classified reports. Thanks. And then, uh, Chairman McGovern, if you'd let me go way philosophical just for one second, I promise I'll wrap it at, at this. Sure. This question will be for all witnesses. Uh, there there was some talk and there was, was some uh, information from the Cato Institute about when you're dealing with terrorists to basically go back to the days um, where, where the Brits would, would almost go after uh, people that were engaging crimes on the high seas. For example, you'd issue a letter of mark. So, uh, and I know Dr. Ron Paul very early on in, in the, in the uh, uh, in the war, we're saying that we should just issue letters of mark against individual terrorists or uh, terrorist cells. I, I'm not, I'm not saying I, I agree with that. I'm just saying for for thought. Have you got given any thought of going back to, um, I hate to say a little letter of mark style because uh, it's so it's so dated, but something like that where you actually do an incredibly narrow um, uh, resolution at a particular group or even a set of individuals. Again, super high hypothetical, but since we're just dealing uh, with this and, and seeing how narrow we get this, I wanted to uh, see if the witnesses had any thoughts. Uh, Mr. Bellinger, I'll, I'll start with you, and if the other uh, uh, if the other witnesses want to jump in, I'll, I'll yield to you. But Mr. Bellinger, I'll yield. I guess I'll be very brief and let my colleagues speak to just say, you know, certainly. Intelligence agencies have certain specific authorities that are reported uh, to uh, uh, the different intelligence committees. The 9-11 Commission, for example, looked at, and this became declassified at the time, the specific authorities that had been given uh, to uh, the intelligence agencies in the Clinton administration to use force against specific al-Qaeda members, including bin Laden, uh, uh, by name. Uh, and that was you know, prior to 2001. Uh, you know, I don't know what they might be doing now, but you know, there can be specific intelligence authorities. Uh, the militarily, you know, I think that would be difficult. I mean, certainly, as you probably know better than I, because you've served more recently than I, you know, I'm sure that there are uh, specific military orders that allow the the use of force against specific terror suspects. Uh, you know, those are just specific standing orders. I don't think we would want to ask Congress, though, to get into the business of authorizing sp use of force against specific individuals. Yeah, thank and just to be clear, I'm not advocating for this necessarily. I just, I'm just putting it out there for the discussion. Um, uh, Dr. Bridgman, I saw it. Did you want to? Um, oh, yeah. You... Yeah, I can just pick up on that, and and I also want to start by thanking you for your service. Um, I know that's a difficult job that you're doing. Um, so I I think the 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 final point that Mr. Bellinger made, I would absolutely agree with. Uh, but. If...
if you want to kind of stay philosophical for a minute, uh, I do think the more specific you can be about individual groups, the better. And that's something that we've we've been talking about is is trying to say terrorism writ large, of course, is is untenable. It gets us into the situation that we're in today when when uh, interpretations uh, of statutory authority get that broad. Um, but but also just to kind of pick up on something you were mentioning before about stabilization operations and, and other kinds kinds of things the Navy does. The Navy is everywhere. Um, we need the Navy to be in a lot of places. Um, but I think we need to keep kind of two different categories in mind. There are the things that the Navy does that are not uses of force and where we don't expect them to use force. Um, there are freedom of navigation operations. There are are, you know, we, we need to send a ship off the coast of West Africa to deal with the Ebola crisis. Um, there's, there's all kinds of things that Congress doesn't need to authorize through, through a, an authorization of use of force that don't implicate the war powers. Um, but nevertheless, we rely on our military to do, um, and in particular the Navy. Um, and that's something that I think we can we can kind of hive off from this discussion in a, in a certain um, sense, because there will there will remain that authority, uh, even if we tighten up what we're doing on the war powers side. So when you kind of cross into the war power side of of what we're doing that implicates using force, there's where I think the the real question is and the harder question is about when uh, when we think Congress needs to authorize it versus when the president should have the authority to go it alone. Um, and I do think that the the vision articulated of you know the the president can use force when U.S. nationals and and U.S. territory. Uh, aren't under threat. I do. I do personally think that's too broad. Uh, I think there's a reasonable discussion to be had here, though. And I think the, the question for those who think it needs to be broader than just protecting the United States, protecting U.S. nationals, is how would you articulate the limiting principle then? Because I think that's what we've lost. Right now, we're we're saying, you know, we see these these OLC lawyers to go back to the the beginning of this hearing. OLC lawyers saying it's just got to be in the national interest, and other than that, it's got to just not be a full out ground invasion where we have, uh, you know, substantial risk of casualties on our side as well. That's the only limit right now, and it's not a limit really when you think about it, right? So if we're going to go any broader than threats to to our national security, to our territory, to our nationals. Uh, we have to think about what those limiting principles are going to be in advance. So I don't think it's enough to just say uh, we need more authority. I think we need to think about what that actually means in practice, what it looks like, and what the limits would be. Thank you, Dr. Bridgman. And Dr. Ingbert, yes, I'll yield to you. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. And I, and I want to reiterate, Dr. Bridgman, thanks for your service. Um, and I'd also love to talk to you about it sometime because it sounds like um, you were doing really fascinating work. And so I just wanted to respond to some some of the things that you um, pointed out because I think that you know, and and in um, Mr. Bellinger's response, sometimes we talk about these decisions as if they're happening overnight in the executive branch, and so there really is no time for Congress to engage. And yet, what we've seen for those of you us who've been who've been sort of working on these issues inside the executive branch or have historically done so. We see that these issues, these questions about designating, for example, a new group as falling within a current authorization to use military force is, is something that happens gradually over time. That's the result of endless meetings, frankly, and endless members, memoranda, and endless running into a skiff to look at the latest white paper. And so these are not questions that I think in the um, in the American public's imagination, these are things that happen instantaneously. But when when we're truly dealing with that kind of an instantaneous threat, the president does have, I think we all agree that the president does have some Article 2 authority to repel such a sudden instantaneous threat. What we're talking about when we talk about designating new groups under the AMF is something that is the result of a slow, deliberative process that's happening inside the executive branch, and we're just suggesting that it happen instead between the branches in consultation with Congress. Hey, thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Ingber. I appreciate it. And I sincerely just want to thank all the witnesses uh, for answering the questions in this discussion. As a former Navy JAG, of course, I could sit here and geek out uh, with, with you all day. But for the for the sake of time, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I referenced uh, uh, an article on Letters of Mark and also a Cato Institute letter. So um, I will get those to you. If you're okay with it, I'd ask for unanimous, unanimous consent to enter both of those uh, articles into the record. Without without objection. And I I have another thing to ask you, and it was consent to add into the record, uh, a, a, um, a letter um, from our colleague, Representative Peter DeFazio, um, 
as my colleagues may know, Representative DeFazio first introduced a bill to reform the War Powers Resolution in his first term of Congress back in 1988. And since then, our colleague has shown relentless commitment to making our government live up to its constitutional duties. On Congress's role, um, he says this, unfortunately, the blame for gradual erosion of Congress's war powers does not lie at the feet of the executive. For decades, Congress itself has shirked its own constitutional responsibility to declare war and prevent executive overreach, determining that it's easier to take credit for unauthorized uh, involvement in popular conflicts or blame the president for unpopular ones. He also says, while repeal of these AUMFs is an important step, it is essential that Congress go further to put in place necessary checks on the executive authority, saying that there is nothing stopping Congress from passing future open-ended AUMFs. And um, he uh, concludes by saying it's beyond time for Congress to tackle the heart of the matter and reform the War Powers Resolution of 1973. And I put that into the, I asked you to consent to put down the record and I now yield to Ms. Scanlon. Thank you. I think we're I think we're having I think we're having a tough time with your connection. Uh, let's see how we let's try one more time here. Technology is a wonderful thing until it's not. I I mean uh, yes. Here we go. Is that any better? That's better, but I can't see you. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay. Okay. I'm just trying to switch between um, types. Well, thank you for holding this hearing and thank you for our witnesses. Is this coming through now? Okay. Yep. Good. Okay. Um, so I represent Southeastern Pennsylvania, which um, is where Pennsylvania began. And it was founded by an Irish Quaker named William Penn. And the region that I represent is still very heavily influenced by Quakers. So I receive regular delegations of constituents wanting to know what I'm going to do about the AUMF of 2002 and generally um, having very strong views on the War Powers Act. So um, this is something that I expect my constituents will be very interested in, in seeing and talking about in the days ahead. Um, I think we just circled back to something I wanted to talk about that, that um, the chairman touched on at the start of the hearing. And that was about the fact that Congress has not just ceded the war powers generally, but particularly the role that the executive has taken with respect to determining when those war powers should be exercised. And the fact that we seem to have defaulted to this 1992 Office of Legal Counsel memo, which sets out a, a uh, whether the president could reasonably determine that a proposed action serves important national interests. And um, administrations of both parties have been criticized for their reliance upon this very broad standard. So if, if we could just talk a little bit, um, we seem to have some agreement that the standard probably needs to be clarified, but could each of you address maybe what kind of terms should be in this standard, maybe starting with Dr. Bridgman? Sure. Yeah, I, th I think that is, uh, in fact, uh, one of the key, the key questions, um, and I'm, I'm glad you brought us back to it. Um, I, I do think um, there is uh, some daylight between us uh, on this panel in terms of how broad that authority should be, how to define it, and what the limitations should be. But I do think we all agree, as you said, the national interest test is no test at all. It's simply a collection of past executive branch practices. Uh, it's sort of if we've done it before, we can do it again. And then we, in fact, add new national interests each time. Um, and likewise, I think the, the idea that the only limiting principle on the other end is a so-called war in the constitutional sense, uh, which in the executive branch's view has required you know, thousands of troops on the ground for a prolonged period of time when there are you know, exchanges of fire and a high risk of casualties on the U.S. side. I don't think that's anywhere near what the Constitution intended. And as I've said, uh, a few times a day, I think that matters because it means there's not democratic accountability for operations short of that threshold. So, uh, you know, I, I think, uh, and what I proposed in my written testimony today is that uh, Congress should 
retake the authority here because I don't think the executive branch is going to start issuing opinions limiting itself. I think they are going to keep building on their past practice. As Professor Ingber said, they're going to do that in good faith for, for reasons they think are important. But I think that's that's why we need Congress to assert itself. And I would say that there's, there's a, a, a pretty simple way to phrase it. Um, I think Congress should should make clear that the president may use force when it is absolutely necessary. And, and here's how I would frame the two circumstances. One is to repel an imminent or sudden attack on the United States. And that's that's clearly what the framers had in mind, the, the sudden attack language you can find in the in the Constitutional Convention. Um, but I would add a second category, which I think um, many believe was actually also envisioned by the founders, but which we've seen as, as sort of a gloss on that sudden attack category over the years, which is to protect, evacuate, or rescue new U.S. nationals in situations where there's a direct and immediate threat to their lives. And I would note that the current War Powers Resolution has something a little bit similar to this uh, in its current text, but it's in that purpose and policy section up in Section 2. And both the executive branch and courts will look at that as essentially surplusage, unfortunately. So in looking at reforming the War Powers Resolution, I think that needs to be in an operative paragraph, and I think it needs to be spelled out clearly. Um, but I think regardless of what's there, uh, unfortunately, the, the political reality is that the executive branch is going to try to push the boundaries unless Congress gives itself teeth um, to enforce those boundaries. And that's where I think you need that funding cutoff and the shortening of the currently 60-day clock um, to ensure that when the president does exceed those boundaries, it doesn't drag us into a full-blown war. Uh, and I think there's always going to be some give and take between the branches there about where exactly that boundary is. What does it mean to protect a citizen facing imminent peril, right? Um, that's that's a healthy debate to have. Uh, but right now, we're not having that debate at all. Right now, what we're, we're not asking is the United States under threat. We're not asking our nationals under threat. We're asking, is there a national interest and is it this kind of huge ground war? Um, those are those are simply the wrong questions. Uh, so I would bring it back into the frame uh, that I that I've just been describing. I'd give yourself the the tools to to police that framing, um, and I would say finally that the the idea that there is uh, you know a need to engage in these other types of operations, these humanitarian operations, these stabilization operations, uh, I would say you know Congress. Uh, used to authorize those kinds of things and could do so again. Um, but the question is really, does the United States need to be using force? And I would say sometimes the answer is going to be yes. Other times the answer is going to be no. Uh, but we can't simply assume that it, it should be up to the president to decide every time when our nationals in our territory uh, are not in fact at risk. That That is where I, I am saying we do need to draw a line in the sand and require Congress to do its duty. So that's that's how I would set out the, the framework. Mr. Bellinger, it looks like you're prepared to comment. Do you want to add this discussion? Uh, I will, although I, I realize uh, that you are a, a distinguished lawyer with a distinguished legal background, so debating OLC opinions may be a dangerous thing. But um, I think um, this is where there's going to be a, a disagreement uh, between me and my two colleagues and friends. Uh, is, uh, oh, I do think that the president has a broader authority as chief executive and commander in chief and under the constitution, uh, presidents of either party to deploy forces in, you know, a mere national interest test is obviously too broad, but uh, uh, the, and, and I really would be very surprised if Congress were to say, that either you know a President Biden or a President Obama uh, uh, or a President Bush were to uh, not have authority to use force on a humanitarian mission uh, to uh, uh, to help another country, a close ally in distress, uh, uh, if, or if its nationals were in distress, whether it be uh, British or Australian or Canadian or Israelis. Uh, I think the idea that other than having just being able to uh, defend against an attack, repel an attack, or rescue Americans is much too narrow a vision of the president's authorities. And I, I wouldn't encourage Congress to try to, to, to say that. So, I mean, if, if Congress tried to pass something that said those are the president's only authorities, a president of either party would veto that. Uh, and so that's why I go back to saying, let's try to come up with something that is realistic uh, that recognizes the president's uh, authorities up to a certain point, uh, but also 
puts Congress in the game. And once again, I do urge you to go back to look at the balance that was struck by the uh, National uh, War Powers Commission, because I thought that was you know, both appropriate legally, but also struck, struck the appropriate political balance. Thank you. Professor Ingvar, do you have any suggestions on how we might narrow the, the national defense um, standard as it's being used? Yeah, I, I do. And I just, I, you know, I really appreciate the concerns that John is raising here, but I also want to caution that the risk here is that either of just sort of slapping a bandaid, you know, on this issue right now and calling it a day and then going another 50 years without ha having another opportunity to do real substantial war power reform. Um, and also the risk of just giving the president constitutional a constitutional delegation of authority to do everything that the president is currently interpreting falls within his Article 2 authority and his um, expansive read of the 2001 and 2002 annual maps. So I agree with Dr. Bridgman's language. I think that actually is a, is, is a fairly um, substantial authority for the president. And I also want to just say that I think something that you're getting at is that you're not going to be able to prevent the executive branch from determining where they believe the line to be, right? They are going to continue to assert their constitutional prerogative, and it's time for Congress to stand up and as part of that sort of interactive dance and say where Congress believes that line should be, not prophylactically backing up because, because the president keeps moving forward, but rather pushing back itself. The result will be in some kind of mix. There is going to inherently recognizing that the president has some authority to repel sudden attacks means that there is going to inherently be some discretion for the president in making those determinations. But even those determinations that are initially secret, those events are always going to later emerge. And when they do, the president is going to have to justify his or her actions. And it will be better that the president have to justify what she did on a self-defense basis than to simply be able to say, well, it was within 60 days, right? Um, and so I think that cabining this authority narrowly is critical at the outset so that you can participate as an equal player in that dance with the president. Thank you. Um, that kind of gets back to the area I wanted to explore briefly. I mean, we've talked a lot about having teeth in the war powers resolution or, or whatever Congress has in order to force the president to do something or cut off the administration from doing something. But as someone who has served during a time when it's been extremely difficult to get Congress to act, I'm, I'm interested in what I think Mr. Bellinger was talking about from the War Powers Commission, which is some kind of trigger to force Congress to act, to force Congress to take charge of moral courage or whatever and put itself on the record. So um, Mr. Bellinger, do you want to speak to that? How could we put ourselves in a better situation where um, at least Congress, but at best both Congress and, and the administration have to engage in this dance to make sure that we are actually um, acting as a check and balance? Sure. Um, so the War Powers, uh, the National War Powers Commission's recommended legislation, which, by the way, was introduced in the Senate by both uh, John McCain and Tim Mc and Tim Kaine, ultimately did not go anywhere, but I would urge it to be picked up again, essentially sort of flipped some of these uh, presumptions. So instead of trying to cut off uh, the president's authority after 60 days, which was just simply not working and therefore uh, made the War Powers Resolution look ineffective, what it set up was a required consultation process. Uh, and then, and I think this is the, the key point, and you all will have to tell me whether this works as a matter of congressional procedure, within 30 days of uh, any significant use of force, i.e. not just a narrow rescue mission, but something that's gone on for more than 30 days, each house would be required to put forward a concurrent resolution that would move immediately to the floor of each house under your respective procedures and then would have to be voted on promptly uh, so that uh, if the president was using force beyond 30 days, Congress would have to vote on it. And you would, if you voted it up, then it would be authorized. If you voted it down, the president didn't have to stop but he 
uh, would be uh, the Congress would have been on record as having voted down what he was doing. Uh, Congress could then go further uh, and then put forward a concurrent resolution to force him to stop. And if you successfully voted to force him to stop, then he would have to veto that. Uh, if he vetoed it, he vetoed it. And if Congress felt so strongly that he ought to stop, then you would override that veto. So I thought those procedures actually, if Congress could engage in that self-discipline to require those votes within 30 days, that's really putting Congress in the game. Well, I don't have any doubt that the Rules Committee of the House would be able to move in such an expeditious fashion and, and perform its duty. I, I may have some doubts about the Senate. Um, Dr. Bridgman, do you have any comments on this proposal? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for coming back to me. I, I think that there are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. One is we we ended with a situation again where you require a supermajority uh, in both chambers to stop the president from using force, even when it's unauthorized and it and it exceeds his Article Two authority uh, in the view of the Congress. And I, I just think that's that's fundamentally both unworkable. I don't think you're going to get those supermajorities, uh, but it's also again turning the constitutional design on its head in a way that matters and it's it's shielding the president uh and his uses of force abroad from democratic accountability so i think we need to look instead um instead of just saying it, it wasn't it wasn't working uh let's look at why it wasn't working and fix those problems right so one of the reasons why this this 60-day cutoff wasn't working was because the executive branch was defining hostility so narrow that it said that clock never even applied right let alone uh, did it did it run its course uh, in in various important cases? The other reason it wasn't working was child. Dringberg explained to us at the beginning of this hearing, uh, right? The the key enforcement mechanism, uh, a simple majority of both houses could stop a, a war once begun, was gutted, and and that wasn't working anymore either. So I think if we want to look at how to fix the actual problems, we need to look at what those problems actually were. Uh, so we need to define hostilities, which uh, there are plenty of, of sound proposals out there to do. I've offered one, there are others. Um, and we need to fix the Chata problem uh, by providing for that uh, that funds cut off. And I think the the incentives are all, all to the better if we shorten that clock. I just heard 30 days recommended. I think that could be workable, 20, 30, something in that time range. Um, but I think the the last thing that, and, and you picked up on this in the, in the beginning with your, your question for John, that's important, um, is how do we make sure Congress votes? So I think those priority procedures are, are absolutely imperative to retain. Um, and there's a, a, a version of, of what uh, John was describing that I think works well, which is that within that period of dependency of the clock, within those 20, 30 days, uh, whatever number you decide, um, if the president submits a request for the authorization to continue using force beyond that time period, it must come to a vote. And that's uh, that's something that can also, uh, you know, the procedures can be crafted such that it can be amended. So it's not just an up or down on the on the president's specific language, but it could be like like was done in the 2001 context, where the the president came to the Congress and said, "This is this is the authority I think I need," and the Congress said, "I, I need to tweak it because that's a little too broad." But here you go, we're going to vote on that. Um, so you can require that that vote be taken. You can require that it be taken within that period of time, and that gives the president the opportunity to come to you to say this use of force needs to extend beyond that period and congress gets to decide that are we going to escalate this into an armed conflict or are we going to provide that authority or have we determined that the purpose has been met right have we determined that no that in fact uh we are uh we are at a point where the uh the situation no longer requires the the use of armed force or do we think uh as has been the case in some of the the engagements described by by members today do we think it's actually an unwise use of force and shortening that clock is is really important to making sure that we're not not already so embroiled that we that it would be irresponsible to pull ourselves back so i think i think we need to keep it in mind for that reason as well uh, the the final thing um that i'll say about this is um the the idea of automaticity of a funding cutoff i think is 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 bothering some people, right? You can you can see that that's 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 difficult. But I would note, um, and 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 it's been suggested that that no pre president would accept it. I would note that President Nixon did not accept it. Congress passed it anyway. There was an automatic cutoff in the War Powers Resolution as enacted. Uh, within 60 days, uses of force that were not authorized had to be terminated, and it was a simple majority of both houses uh, that was that was uh, sufficient to enforce that. But even without that vote, if if a use of force was not authorized 
it was to be terminated without Congress acting at all. I'm simply proposing that that needs to be the case again, but that now, given the state of the law, given Supreme Court precedent, given the way that we've seen the current war powers framework failing, we just need to update that mechanism. And it may be that that you will face political headwinds in doing so, but this isn't a Republican Democrat issue. This is an Article One, Article Two issue. So I would say it, it may be tricky, uh, but it is something that Congress has done before, and this is that once in a generation opportunity to do it again and to make sure that that framework is shored up in a way that's actually meaningful. Thank you, uh, Professor Ingber. You know, if you have anything to add here, kind of with a uh, focus on how do we make sure that Congress is doing its job. Yeah, on a, honestly, I can't really, um, I can't really say that better than Tess just did, um, Dr. Bridgman just did. But, um, but I agree that this is a really important question, and the issue here is about flipping the status quo. So making it so that if Congress cannot act. The president cannot act rather than when Congress is unable to act for political reasons. The president can it just is like has the, the space to, to do whatever the president wants to do. And so um, the one thing that I want to add to all this is that the Chada decision affected certain interbranch relationships, right? So the Chada decision um, established that Congress can't make law effectively without the president um, unless they can. Um, supersede a presidential veto. But the Chapa decision and the Supreme Court has nothing to say about how Congress addresses its own internal procedures. That is within your control. And so it is within your control to change those procedures in order to establish that, they, that these things can come to a vote. And I think these are really important questions. These are important discussions to have with the House and Senate parliamentarians. As Dr. Bridgman said, these are not partisan issues. These are questions about Congress's institutional prerogatives as a whole. Um, and just reestablishing a sense of responsibility for Congress to act. It may well be that because this is not truly a partisan issue, this might be one area where members of Congress can work together. Well, thank you, and I appreciate all of your insight. It's been really, really helpful. Uh, you know, as, as I said, I'm interested in how we can get Congress back in the game because as our professor uh, uh, Raskin always tells us, there's a reason why Congress is Article One. Uh, but with that, I would be back. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fishbach. There we go. I got it finally. Um, and and I, I appreciate the uh, the conversation about the procedures because I did have some questions about that. And, and, and so if there is anything that any of the witnesses would want to add about maybe uh, suggestions regarding the procedures and how it happens. But I, I did want to throw this out and to any of the um, any of the panelists, you know, should there be distinctions um, in the types of actions? I know we talked about the length, but uh, potentially if, you know, uh, certain actions tied to certain length of engagement and, um, you know, such as a single mission or ongoing engagements, I guess I'd, you know, maybe to add that into the discussion about procedures. And um, whoever would like to start, I would love to hear some ideas on that or just thoughts on that. Mr. Bellinger, <laughs> since you look like you wanted gonna, to, there you go. I was I was going to defer to my academic colleagues, uh, but uh, I'll 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 go ahead and serve something up. Um, let me actually just briefly go backwards one step in terms of saying, I, I think you heard from my opening statement that I am also very much in favor of war powers reform, both the 2001 AUMF, the 2002 AUMF, and the war powers resolution. But I, I also to go back to something that, that the chairman said in his first sentence is, you know, we have, a, we have an administration and a president who says he's prepared to support war powers reform, but if Congress goes too far, uh, he's gonna veto it. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. And so I, urge Congress to seize this opportunity to come up with something that the president is going to support and not veto. The War Powers Resolution in 1973 was passed over President Nixon's veto, but you know this was in the middle of the impeachment of Richard Nixon. Congress was not pleased with President Nixon at the time. You know, now is a time, whether you're Republicans or Democrats, that one can, I think, work with President Biden on realistic war powers reform. But if you try to clip the president's powers you know, too much, you're going to get a veto 
it's not going to be overridden, and then the whole exercise will have been academic. So I I urge you to come up with realistic war powers reform. Um, I think you're exactly right uh, that certain kinds of force should be recognized that the president has within his authorities, uh, but other kinds of force you know that are certainly going to get us into a significant war or going to last more than a certain period of time. Uh, uh, and again, that's what the National War Powers Commission tried to do was to give recognize and give the president a fair amount of flexibility while saying if it goes beyond a particular time or beyond a certain amount of force, uh, that that's when Congress would be required uh, to take a vote. So it didn't actually, to your procedural question, it didn't require Congress to take a vote every time the president used uh, force beyond a rescue mission. I think uh, they said uh, uh, a, a use of force that continued to last beyond 30 days with troops on the ground uh, somewhere. So I think you're, you're right that that's an area where uh, one could try to come up with refinement about what the Congress considers acceptable uh, and and what they want to be able to have a vote on. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Ingver. I think it's going to be very much fact. Hi, I think it's going to be very much fact dependent. I think that um, I, I I don't think you necessarily need to include in the War Powers Resolution itself. Should you reform it, language about whether or not your future AUMFs will carve out particular activities. But I do think that each time the president comes to you. And you have this um, renewed engagement that I that I don't think um, that may seem uh, you know un, unimaginable now, but would become a, a natural reality should uh, should you pass this reform. You will be having those conversations. You will be hearing mm -hmm. the president present evidence about what the president's advisors believe is necessary to prosecute the war, and then you will be making a determination about whether or not you think you need to cabin that or whether or not you trust the president's vision um, and whether and what you think is going to it's that's going to meet you know if you don't include a sunset what you think that's going to look like in 20 years and so um while i think up front it's important to talk about things like including sunsets for the for the for these exact reasons i think once you create a, a scenario where the status quo is the president coming to congress or in order to have exchanges of information before entering into these conflicts you're going to start to have views about the president's use of those authorities. And so you may well want to include those kinds of um, determinations inside your future AUMS. Thank you. And and Dr. Bridgman, do you have anything to add or that you? Uh, just briefly, I'll add that I'm glad you're focused on the priority procedures because I think they matter quite a lot. Uh, and I think uh, it's as you know, we've we've seen this in the in the the Yemen and Iran votes that those priority procedures are why those those votes took place. Um, but I think it's also right to to focus as as some of us have been talking about on what are the priority procedures that are going to be in place um, if the president comes to you asking for an authorization. Uh, how do you how do you make sure that that gets the vote that it deserves when the president says no we we need to be using force for a longer period of time or we need to be mm -hmm. you know escalating our, our use of force into a, into a broader conflict. So I think both of those situations need to be addressed, both how Congress members um, in the absence of the president coming to you can can use those priority procedures to to cut off a use of force, but also how you vote to make sure that you can uh, authorize something that, that needs to be authorized. Uh, the last thing I'll say is is in relation to I think your your question picked up on this question of short uses of force or uses of force over um, kind of individual yeah, discrete yeah. time periods. If I'm, yeah, so I think um, and you, you may be referring in part to uh, what within the executive branch is, is colloquially called the, the intermittence theory of war powers, uh, right, where I, I take a strike on Monday and I call it closed and then I take us and I report it on Wednesday and then I take a strike on Thursday and I call that matter closed and I and I report it on Saturday and then I take a strike on Sunday. Right. And so is the is the clock running or not? Uh, are we getting into a, a conflict or not? Um, this is something where I think there there can be, you know, there can be some some reasonable disagreement as to whether each of these strikes was in fact discrete, whether you saw the other ones coming in advance. Uh, but I think the more kind of faithful way to go about looking at this question is to consider a series of strikes against the same enemy in the same theater, right? Uh, or to, uh, to consider an, an escalation um, that we see developing over time, to consider that part of one 
uh, one escalation in, into hostilities or, or one escalation into a, into a situation where at least we know uh, with some certainty that, that hostilities might be imminent in that in that kind of escalating series. Now it's Republicans and Democrats who've done this, right? President Reagan did this in, in the in the uh, you know the tanker wars, uh, and President Obama did this in the summer of 2014 with what became the counter ISIL campaign. So again, I think this is an interbranch issue, not a political issue, uh, but it's one that I think Congress can address by saying low intensity uses of force or intermittent uses of force are are still things that that are are going to count as hostilities or imminent hostilities for the purposes of us looking at whether they need to be authorized before they escalate into a into a full blown war. Uh, so I would take those into account and I think you're right to be focused on that as well. Well, thank you very much. And and I will say there's um, there's a lot to think about with just the procedures, not not all of the other just uh, and and so I appreciate that that there's going to have to be a, a lot of discussion regarding those procedures and and I appreciate all of your answers and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. And I just want to ask unanimous consent to add a letter uh, from our colleague, Representative Brad Sherman, to the record. Uh, as he's worked uh, for more than a decade to use uh, the power of the purse to strengthen the war powers resolution and to rein in executive branches overreach. Uh, and in the letter that he sent to us, uh, he discusses his efforts to make these restrictions on use of appropriations without prior authorization for military action stronger and clearly stated in the law. So I'll put that in the record and I now want to yield to Mr. Morelli. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to you and to uh, the ranking member. This is uh, one of those, uh, we don't have many instances where we do original jurisdiction hearings, but I always find them uh, uh, incredibly uh, important, thoughtful. I appreciate the comments of all my uh, my colleagues, so I just want to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and the ranking member for uh, putting this together. Uh, and I want to thank the witnesses. This has really um, been a, um, a a very illuminating conversation, obviously about a very very important topic. Uh, one of the, um, I guess, I don't know if this is an advantage or disadvantage of being near the end is that a lot of the things that you were going to ask have been asked. Um, but what it leaves you with is a lot of different things that have been touched on. So this is going to seem like a lightning round in a talk or in a, a game show. It'll be all over the place, and they won't necessarily come together. But um, but I do I, I fundamentally agree with uh, the chair, uh, with Mr. Cole and my colleagues relative to um, you know the balance here between Article One and Article Two, and the need to ensure that the framers' intent, as I understand it, to vest this power in the people because we were directly elected and we would be the closest to the people. So we would best represent uh, the views of the public around the, the serious question of war. Um, uh, so I wanted to just go back to, to, to sort of the framers and just for historical uh, context, because it's clear that war in the 21st century or conflict in the 21st century is dramatically different than it would have been in the 18th century. And so, in the colonial era, was it, 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 I don't know how to sound this without sounding like an idiot, but was it necessarily a declaration of war? Did, 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 did governments um, have conflicts with other only around declarations or was it as it is today, just minor battles here and there without a formal declaration? Um, and I don't know who is best to answer that, whoever the historian in the group is, but just sort of curious as to just the, the roots of the use of the phrase declaration of war in the constitution, which is clearly given to uh, to the Congress in article one. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah I'm happy to, to start, you know, I don't think any of us are, are pure historians, but, um, but we've all been thinking about these issues for so long. We probably all have um, similar, similar senses about it. I mean, so there was a lot of discussion about what um, declare war would mean between the which for the Constitution, and so yeah. it was included to include attacks, and it was in, it was essentially the power to bring the country to war. But there was a lot of discussion about what what it would also not include, and um, and this Didn't is they, where may I, have, I'm sorry, may I interrupt for one second? I just Somewhere I read, and I don't know if this is accurate, that the original draft had the, the phrase make war, which was then changed to declare as though it's a more formal thing. And I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I um, I just I just 
that occurred to me. I should probably ask that as part of the question. No, it's 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 absolutely you're absolutely correct. I mean, there was a there was a whole discussion about this. Should it be make war? Should you be declare war? And what does this mean? And this is where we get the understanding from this direct conversation that was happening at, as they were crafting the language about the repel sudden attacks authority. Because you know we keep talking about this repel sudden attacks authority, but that is actually not written into the Constitution, right? The Constitution right, right. gives quite explicitly gives con Congress very you know a whole range of powers, and the only only thing the Constitution says to the, about the president's power is that the president is the commander in chief. And so there was some discussion about this. And there was, a, I believe, if I could recall correctly, there was one representative who wanted to put this in the in the president's hands. And and the, everyone was up in arms, like, I can't believe someone would suggest right, right. that we we've just, you know, we've just left the king, right? And so um, and so this is where that conversation about the repel sudden attacks happened. It was understood that by giving this this declare war power to the president, that there would be this limited implicit, because it was not explicit, an implicit carve out for the president only to be able to act to repel sudden attacks. And that was again upheld 100 years later by the Supreme Court in the prize cases when the president finds himself at war in a, in, in a very different context, in a civil war, and the Supreme Court said, when there's actually de facto war on the ground, when the war comes to the president rather than the president initiating the war, um, of course the president is able to respond. Um, and and the and Supreme Court pointed out when there is no time to convene Congress. Yeah, and and but even in colonial eras, there were battles without declared wars. Did, 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 was that part of the conversation? Like the United States engages in conflict without a declaration. Or were they just simply silent on it and sort of, you know, with, the, with I imagine not wanting to get too much into the details because you can never have a fact pattern that's always going to be the case in a in a future conflict. I can I can add to that if helpful. Yeah. I, I, you know, you can look back um, very early on at, at some examples of this. You know, uh, we we start falling out with the French and uh, the French Navy starts seizing our merchant vessels. And what does the president do? Well, he comes to Congress and he says, I need an authorization. And lo and behold, Congress does not declare war against France because that would have imported all of the war authority, right? That that would have been essentially you you do whatever you need to do within the law of armed conflict. No, the, the Congress said, Well, we're gonna we're gonna authorize this uh because we, we see a need here, um, but we're gonna make it limited. Um and Congress could even say you can seize ships going in one direction, but not the other, because uh, that's where the threat is is originating from, and and we don't we don't need to police it in the other direction, and that would just escalate conflict. We want to de-escalate. We want to give you the authority you need, but we want to de-escalate. And Congress would make those very fine choices, and the Supreme Court would uphold Congress's ability to do that. Uh, yeah, so that's the, a long history of of Congress really regulating the extent of armed conflict as well. And I think there were instances too of Jefferson where. The United States Navy commandeer ships um, basically took supplies off and then just released them because they didn't have there was no declaration of war at the time and they were he was much more of a limited view on on this. Um, I want to just, uh, Mr. Morelli, could I just add one more. sentence on this? Yes, sorry. Sir. And I realize you asked a historical question, but I do think the text here is important, which is Congress. The, the framers could have said that Congress has the authority to authorize the use of force. But they chose the words declare war. And in Article 2, they said the president is the commander in chief of the military. So I really would argue that even textually, and this is, I think, supported historically, that Congress clearly has the authority for a, a major declaration of war or to authorize getting into something that is going to be a war. But it, it's not a lower level to say that Congress has the authority to tell the president every time he's going to use force. That's an Article II power for the president to be commander in chief. So I think those words declare but, war are significant. Yeah, and I did want to get to this um, because I, that really brings me to some questions about present day. Um, but before I do that, um, is a declaration necessary for a state of war to exist with the United States? No. no. So, so Pearl Harbor uh, happened, the Japanese attacked the United States. We're effectively in war even without a, a declaration by Congress, aren't we? Correct. Um, so the declaration is, so tell me then, because I'm sure there were, there's a precedent in the Supreme Court and others 
around when a state of war exists. It can clearly exist without a, a congressional declaration. Tell me a little bit about when that state occurs. Is it then necessary for Congress to affirm that we're in a, uh, to, to, to declare it? Or, and how long could that go on? How long could a war go on without a congressional declaration? So this is addressing sort of two different bodies of law. The, the, the body of law that most directly deals with when a state of conflict is, is, is occurring is actually international law. And so under international law, a state of armed conflict exists between two states, um, whether or not the states recognize it, whenever there's a use of force between those states. And so certainly the, the, when the framers were using the concept of war at the time, they were using that, that word against a backdrop understanding of what it meant under international law. I mean, these are people who had you know, copies of Mattel on their bookshelves. And so that is the understanding for a state of arm, for a state of armed conflict between states. It gets a little bit more complicated when you're talking about a state of conflict between a state and a non-state actor, because surely not every use of force between a state and any individual out there who's not themselves a state actor is not going to be a state of armed conflict, right? I mean, normally those are those are more properly addressed under a criminal justice framework. And it is only certain kinds of activities, prolonged hostilities with a group that is that has the capacity to act as a military actor, has a military hierarchy, can direct orders, um, is we call those organized armed groups. It is only really prolonged hostilities between the United States or any state and an organized armed group that has those capacities that we think of in war terms. And so the reason we, you know, the, we, we sort of stopped using declarations of war for a variety of reasons, in part as the international law on this concept was shifting. We also around the same time, the international community prohibited a war, right? It prohibited the use of aggressive force to solve, for example, policy disputes. And therefore it became only um, lawful for states to use force when acting in self-defense. And around that same time, Congress stopped declaring wars and started issuing authorizations to use military force. But today the executive branch interprets an authorization to use military force as if it provides all the powers of a declaration of war, unless it is cabined in particular ways. And, and so the, um, I think the, our last declaration of war was 1942, is that right? The United States Congress last declared war against mm -hmm. the, uh, the Axis yes. powers. So, and obviously we've been in, you know, conflict, Cold War, Korea, Vietnam, uh, the Middle East for much of the, uh, the um, 80 years since that declaration of war. So the whole question of declaration of war seems it really is then about the the um, use of force and when Congress shall be consulted, but it's less about declaration and because Article One doesn't say anything short of declaration of war. It does give us the power to um, appropriate, so that's obviously one of the powers reserved in Article One. So how do you how do you like sort yeah. of give me a sense of your interpretation of that without? So Article One says declaration of war by the Congress. It gives us powers to appropriate, but it, it doesn't say anything about use of military force to, 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 to uh, Mr. Bellinger's point, maybe that's what the framers ought to have done. They, they you know, I don't know whether that was a part of the d discussion, um, but I'm just sort of curious, and, and, and this may be a fundamental sort of too basic a point, but I'm just sort of curious your take on it. I think they, they if I can come in on this briefly, I think they, they very much did understand to have themselves to have vested that in Article One in Congress. Uh, it wasn't just the power to declare war. It was, as you say, the power to raise and support armies and navies, uh, you know, the, the power to grant letters of mark and reprisal, to define and punish laws against uh, offenses against the law of nations. They were dealing with essentially the, the range of threats that, that one could envision at the time, right? It was piracy. It was uh, you know, your your merchant vessels being seized by another nation's navy that hadn't declared war on you. It was all of this range of, of things that there are very much equivalents in the modern day. They vested all of that in Congress. The one thing they carved out for the president was the ability to respond if you were attacked. And that is, 
I think still the place uh, where where we should think about drawing the line. Although I, I agree, it needs to be a little bit broader than just an armed attack on the United States. I do think there is that uh, you know rescuing U.S. nationals in peril. But if we go beyond self-defense, if we say the commander in chief has authority beyond that, I do think it's ahistorical. I don't think. No, that I guess Congress, so. Yeah. Yeah, and I don't want to put too fine a point, and I certainly don't mean to be argumentative. But since the power still, since the power to appropriate is still clearly vested with the Congress. When could an argument be made that if we're sort of imbalanced, the Congress could stop funding activities overseas that they think violate um, or that are not in the the, the, the the public interest around national security. Um, and we still have the power to do that. So what, so might someone say, so what's the conflict? The the conflict is that the, the Congress hasn't been doing that, <laughs> right? Well, and we haven't been appropriating. Well, the, the Congress hasn't been cutting off uh, funds effectively. And I think one of the reasons uh, that the War Powers Resolution contained uh, that, that termination provision was to, to add some automaticity to that. And that's why this, this idea of a funds cutoff, which isn't new in today's hearing, of course, uh, is, is to put that power uh, right back in the heartland of, of the president's core Article I authority. So I think the, the, the other thing, though, to keep in mind was Congress didn't used to appropriate uh, for a standing army at all, there wasn't one. <laughs> um, the way defense budgets work now is something you all are more expert at than I am. Uh, but it's very easy for the military to shift vast sums of money around. Uh, so, so you know, trying to authorize or or cease authorization through appropriation has actually become a lot trickier. Uh, and that's why I think too, a, a funds cutoff is something that um, is cleaner, is less ambiguous, and is going to be more easy to accomplish. So, uh, and I apologize, uh, Mr. Chair, but I'll, I'll close with just sort of this sort of observation. Maybe people could could comment on this. The one thing that I do um, uh, worry about is sort of the nature of war um, and the nature of conflict now. So interrupting the supply chain uh, with cyber attacks, it, it does seem to me that, that, that what we do will be maybe even in, in the course of, 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 of conflict will be less around use of force in the traditional sense and more about getting our power uh, plants to stop operating or attacking our commercial and banking system and so i i wonder uh, first of all about whether what what our role is or what the how we divide those responsibilities and what will be perhaps ongoing continued not intermittent unless you decide to take that view which is sort of an interesting observation intermittent uh war but this is instead it just uh, just depend on it that the, the Chinese, the Russians, whoever it is, is going to employ continuous, ongoing, continued threats to the United States and without necessarily sending troops, because that's, you know, 20th century, 19th century warfare. But that warfare that we look at will be completely non-traditional. And how do we sort of reconcile all of that? And the last thing I would say, and I'd be happy to have people um, comment on sort of supply chain, use of influence, other cyber technology, uh, AI, et cetera. And then finally this, um, you know, I, I feel a little bit like <clears throat> the way we talk about this now is like, you know, a, a telegram from me to my mother in uh, in college, you know, uh, uh, spent too much, uh, gambled all my tuition money away, stop, send money, stop, love Joe, stop, um, and then wait for her response, and then we respond. I mean, it, it almost seems in the modern world where you have these ongoing conflicts and ongoing hostilities, that maybe a different mechanism rather than declare war, appropriate money, consult 90 days, 60 days, that maybe we, there ought to be something more like a cell phone conversation where the executive and the Pentagon is meeting with a select group of members. Uh, maybe it's the Intelligence Committee, maybe it's Arm, House Armed Services, but there is dialogue literally every day about conflicts and hotspots, and then some judgment by <clears throat> that uh, uh, assigned group to bring it to Congress when appropriate. Uh, you know, again, I, I I don't know how you'd work this out. It just seems the way that we talk about it isn't necessarily reflective of the world in which we live. And the final thing I'll say is the observation that if <laughs> if if something can be vetoed by the president, requiring two two thirds to get where the Congress is when we only need a majority to declare war, seems completely upside down that if you're going to use these kinds of congressional stops, they have to be almost, it won't happen unless there's an affirmative 
authorization by the Congress, because any other way, it just it doesn't make any sense. So, and I'm not sure people want to respond to. Uh, I don't not about my spending the tuition money on uh, you know poker, but uh, just the nature of the way we do this and whether or not we need to have a different kind of conversation about that balance between the executive and the legislative branches to help um, you know continue the integrity of Article One, Article Two responsibilities. I'll just briefly weigh in to say that um, that first of all, I I agree with the the last point you made entirely that you need to reset that balance um, on the question of, of sort of regular constant consultations. I do think that resetting the balance will incentivize those kinds of regular conversations, right? So I don't think that 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 behind the scenes one off calls with a few members of Congress can can replace. Congressional authorization of the use of the of the use of military force, but right. I do think that if Congress is in the position of having to to make those um, de determinations, that is going to require that there be much more constant, a uh, regular communication at sort of a lower level, right? With not just members of Congress and and Secretary of Defense, but also with staff between staffers, um, and those kinds of conversations again. The executive branch, we think of the executive branch as acting with dispatch, but the reality is the executive branch is also a they. It is also thousands and thousands of people. And so they are having these conversations. This is not something that turns on a dime either. And so it is not asking too much or, or right to have them expand that conversation to also engage Congress. And that will happen in the way you're describing if Congress is in control of the appropriations and a more sort of specific targeted means of doing so, right? Of actually having to authorize force rather than simply stand up and and throw it throw itself in front of an already on on you know um, well on its way war. Thank you. Any... I'll just briefly on the the consultation point. I will simply say uh, again. I know I've talked a lot about the National War Powers uh, uh, Commission, but. They did spend two years sort of looking at these war powers issues and took a lot of uh, testimony. And they, as part of the, the replacement legislation for the war powers resolution, um, in addition to these uh, procedural reforms that I talked about earlier, uh, they would create a joint congressional consultation committee, which would essentially take the chairs of the key uh, committees uh, and then have essentially just what you said, Mr. Morelli, constant consultation, both before and during a conflict. So it wasn't just, you know, a 48 hour report lobbed up to Congress and then nothing, and then 60 days and a sudden cutoff. I mean, real constant consultation uh, between the executive and the, and the legislative. If, if I can come in on this too briefly, I, I do think uh, consultation is vitally important, but I would note that the uh, this commission model it did allow, uh, if I'm recalling correctly, the president to put off those kinds of exchanges until three days after the conflict has commenced, if secrecy so demands. And I think that probably virtually guarantees that all presidents are going to say that secrecy demands it, and you're going to fall back right right where we are with after the fact consultation. So what I'm trying to propose in this basket of what I think are, are you know, a, a low hanging fruit basket of reforms um, is that if if there is that backstop of that cutoff and if the, if the 60 day clock is shortened, that consultation will have to occur beforehand. Uh, the president just sees it coming. And so it's it's a, it's a given that 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 has to occur. Um, but I also think it's important to keep in mind um, what you're mentioning about, uh, you know, what does the world look like today in situations short of, of the use of force as we know it? Um, so what we're talking about here in this basket of reforms, you know, they they apply to situations where it looks like there's going to be a use of force that's imminent or where we're already in some sort of hostilities. Um, these are these are ways to bring Congress into that discussion, but when we're talking about all these other situations, uh, I think you're absolutely right that Congress has to be involved in in understanding the day to day. Uh, committees of jurisdiction over some of these issues already are, and there have been some reporting requirements um, that have that have been required to to put the Congress on notice uh, when you have these kinds of activities. Activities, some of them lie in the in the covert action realm. Um, and the president is indeed supposed to notify Congress before engaging in covert action. There's some exceptions to that. Um, there are, um, you know, ad additional, I think, 
things that that we can do to ensure uh, that those consultations uh, are more meaningful again through those committees of jurisdiction legislating it. Uh, but for the purposes of 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 this discussion and for for the purposes of war powers reform, um, I think the the kind of structural reform that we've talked about incentivizes that consultation much more than anything else you could write into a statute. Um, and then also strengthening that reporting once it's happened. So the president going silent after 48 hour report uh, for up to six months following it just just makes no sense, right? There needs to be regular reporting of meaningful information, including access to threat information um, that that has to be you know a regular drumbeat at least once a week. I would say and the executive branch has this information. The executive branch is discussing this information. All we're saying is 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 bring Congress into that conversation. So I I think you're right to focus on that, uh, and that if we look at it in situations short of force, we can see what's coming ahead, and that's that's part of your responsibility as well. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. I, I'm not sure I've seen much in the way of low hanging fruit past the Congress in the last couple of years, but who knows? Some uh, you know. Uh, hope springs eternal, but Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you so much. I yield back. Uh, Ms. Ross. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, Ranking Member Cole. This is such an important time, and it's going to be, I think, a unique moment in history to address an issue that Congress has not addressed for way, way too long. Um, as Mr. Morelli said, most of the questions have been um, asked and answered ably. Um, my last question actually picks up on the, the last point that um, Mr. Morelli raised about meaningful reporting and transparency and, you know, setting up a, a way of doing that and then a way of correcting the record. I mean, it comes to mind that the last time um, there was an authorization of force it was based on having weapons of mass destruction that we found out later we didn't did not exist and had that information been correct in the first place there might have been a different decision from congress and so um i'd like you to comment on you know congress needs to be much more robust in what it how it exercises its powers but Congress can only do what it does with accurate information and um, how we could set up a situation to have more accurate information and the correction of inaccurate information as soon as possible. And um, any comments would be appreciated. I could start with some data if that would be helpful because I've just had the the pleasure and the pain of looking at every single unclassified 48 hour report ever filed uh, for the purposes of building this database at, at NYU's RCLS and it is searchable and filterable um, and you can look at all the presidents uh, since 1973 all the different types of missions they've reported and you can click through and look at the individual reports. And I will affirm uh, exactly what you're saying, that there is a boilerplate that's used for two out of the three of the required fire categories. So the, the War Powers Resolution requires three things, the circumstances necessitating introduction, the legislative and constitutional authority, and the estimated scope and duration of the activity. And for those latter two, for the, for the legal authority and for the estimated scope and duration, you can almost see cut and pastes. Uh, there's, a, there's a couple of versions of that language. And it's it's partly because Congress hasn't pushed back and asked for more, and it's partly because there's a an understandable executive branch practice of only saying so much as you absolutely need to satisfy a record, reporting requirement, lest you set a precedent uh, that that more information is revealed. So um, I, I go through it in, in detail in my written testimony. I won't bore you with it today. I think there's a whole series of other. Uh, kinds of information that Congress should be asking for in those 48 hour reports that should not be considered too onerous because the executive branch does have that information before authorizing an operation. Um, but to your point about changes, uh, I think we all recognize that then going silent after those 48 hour reports is an, is an unacceptable state of affairs. And I think one of the, the easiest ways to get at that is if you require more meaningful information on the front end. And then you require it to be updated on a regular basis to include any change in the factual situation, any change in the threat reporting, any change in the information prior, uh, you know, reported to Congress in, in prior uh, notifications, then there is that duty on the executive branch to notify you of any changes, whether they be by error or mistake, whether they were by omission, uh, but that, that duty is then placed on the executive branch. 
to do that updated reporting. Uh, and so, and that's something that I think you should also consider adding in the costs because it's something your constituents care about. I think uh, it's something we all we all care about that adds up over time that currently is obscured. It's not in the reporting at all. Um, so I think there's a, a couple of of easy ways that you can get more meaningful reporting on the front end, and then require it to be updated regularly. Regularly, um, you know, once once that uh, that initial forty eight hour report has come in. Can I uh, actually agree and disagree? Um, the uh, having uh, signed off on every War Powers report for eight years in the Bush administration, and Tess, you've been there, so I'm a little surprised you're making that recommendation. It is a mad scramble to try to get a report uh, drafted and signed by the president within 48 hours. We are down often to minutes chasing the president uh, wherever he she happens to be to get that 48-hour report signed and approved by the Defense Department, the Justice Department, the State Department, and up through the White House to the president. So this is why they are short. Uh, uh, so I would not support a recommendation to try to require a longer 48-hour report, or it's just never going to get to Congress within 48 hours. Uh, you know, in general, I think we actually ought to do away with the 48 hour reporting, but I would not try to uh, force the president to put more in the 48 hour report. That said, the part where I will agree is that Congress should have uh, the background uh, uh, on a use of force. Uh, and frankly, if more needs to be done in a classified setting, uh, the better. Uh, the, you know, we don't have to get a lot into the the Soleimani strike right now, but I think that that was troublesome to you know people on both sides of the aisle, Republican or Democratic, and the, the the administration obviously you know shifted position by first saying that there was an imminent threat, and then well maybe there wasn't an imminent threat, and you know that Soleimani was just a bad guy. But I I do think that it is important uh, to your point that the executive branch you know brief uh, as quickly as possible and correct things and you know all of us who've been in the executive branch but also in congress you know the 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 first reports uh, are of information can turn out to be inaccurate uh and executive branch officials may misstate things and then information comes in and it needs to then be corrected but i agree with you there needs to be a regular and that is something congress should insist on um all these other things uh you know, changes in law, uh, cutting off of funding. You know, the one thing Congress really ought to do is demand that executive branch officials come up, brief, uh, brief in a closed setting, and then come up again. You're right if something needs to be corrected. Can I just add one clarification to that, which is that um, the reports did used to be longer. So before your time or mine, John's, and I, and I suffered through many of these, they were the action was taken on a Friday night and we had to report it by a Sunday and it's it's never fun. Um, but when you look back, it's, it's in particular some of the more controversial uses of force in the Clinton era, for example, Bosnia, Kosovo, the reports are much longer and they go into much more detail about the factual circumstances, the threats at issue, what our allies were going to be doing, whether or not we were going to be acting alone, uh, what the UN Security Council had or hadn't said in the weeks prior. Uh, it's that kind of information that the government already has at its fingertips that I think is is fair to, to request. But but I hear you on the crunch. <laughs> and I'll just um, add to all that um, uh, that this goes back to a discussion we had earlier that as Congress in, takes more responsibility to authorize these actions and engages more regularly with the president on these issues, members of Congress, but also congressional staff are going to build expertise and not just expertise, but also a sensibility about what the evidence that the president is giving to them means, where the holes are, what is the information they're not actually getting. It's about knowing the questions to ask and where to push back. I think all of us who worked in the executive branch knew we sort of gained a spidey sense about, okay, you're telling me this, but like, what's the actual evidence that's underlying that statement? That this individual's a fighter, okay, but where's the evidence that you put together that, you know, that gives us, that, that tells me that that individual is a fighter, for example. Um, and that is, that is 
a sensibility and expertise that can be built up. And so I think that some of the questions that should be included when you are once if you can reset the balance so that the status quo shifts and so that that the president is making a case to you, not merely just sort of sending you off some boilerplate, but making a case to ask you to authorize force that there's no reason not to ask for questions like, well, what's your plan, not just for why you need to go in, but how you're going to win this war and what's your plan for the end game? And those are questions that you're going to I, that I think people will feel more confident asking as as your staff builds that expertise. Um, and I don't think there's any reason not to ask those questions. The fact that the president may be the commander in chief does not mean that when you are making the decision at the outset to authorize force, you shouldn't know how the president's planning to exercise that commander in chief authority. Um, thank you very much for all of those answers. Hopefully the foreign affairs committee will ask the same kinds of questions. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Well, thank you very much. But I think we, we have the better hearing. So I, I want to state that for the record. But before I'm going to yield to Mr. Cole for any closing remarks, he has, has and then I'll make some closing remarks. But I do want to thank the staff uh, and on both sides, but on the majority side, Kim Corbin, uh, Kaylin Hodgkins, uh, Ali Neal, uh, Laurie Ismail, Liz Pardue, uh, Cindy Buell, and Don Sisson. I want to thank them for uh, for their help in getting this together. And Mr. Cole, I don't know if you want to have some closing thoughts before I close. Uh, yeah, just quickly, if I may, Mr. Chairman, first of all, let me start by thanking you again. Uh, I think this was a really important hearing, really productive hearing. I want to thank all of our witnesses. I thought uh, you were all extraordinary and, and very, very helpful to us. And frankly, your real life experience, your academic backgrounds has uh, shed a great deal of insight. Um, I do think, Mr. Chairman, you made a key point in your opening remarks when you said uh, maybe we've caught lightning in a bottle. I think your, your eloquent phrasing is probably right. We have a unique opportunity in front of us uh, I know one that you've labored long and hard to create, and uh, a lot of us have been supportive at uh, different stages along the way, but I don't think anybody's worked harder than you in the Congress of the United States to try and get us to this point. And I'd be remiss not to uh, uh, give a shout out to the administration as well, as you did again in your remarks, for opening this door and saying, hey, this is something we ought to look at. And I think... Uh, Mr. Bellinger made a, a a wise and cautionary warning. Let's not overplay our hand here. I, and and uh, Mr. Bellinger, for your benefit, I think it's very unlikely a Democratic House and a Democratic Senate, or an evenly divided Senate, however you want to look at it, uh, is likely to send a Democratic president something he's not willing to sign. Um, so I don't think that's a serious danger. But I, I do take your bigger point, which is we need to work with the executive branch in this. Uh, but uh, it's refreshing to see an executive branch, and I've seen them in both parties, that actually wants to work to restore the balance of power that's been lost here. And that's to the president's credit and may well be because, as my, my friend, the chairman, suggested, he's been on the other side wrestling with these questions as a, as a member of the United States Senate for many years. But for whatever reason, it's a unique and fleeting opportunity, and I think we would really be remiss not to act on it. And I think we can act on it in a bipartisan way. You certainly, Mr. Chairman, ticked off a number of, of areas where all our witnesses were in agreement uh, at the beginning of the testimony, uh, such as repealing the, the uh, 91 and 2001 AUMFs and reform, actually, two, uh, two AUMF, reforming the 2001, looking seriously at the war power. There's broad agreement here amongst the people that we have who are, are people that, again, have experienced these problems in real time. And I think very broad agreement in the Congress as well, or at least the potential for that right now. And uh, and strangely enough, uh, again, uh, an opportunity to work with as opposed to against the executive branch to achieve this outcome. So shame on us if we don't take advantage of this very unique opportunity. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll just conclude and say I look forward to working with you on that. This is an area we've worked on together in the past, uh, but it's an area where I think you in particular have uh, shown a great deal of tenacity and distinction and foresight over many, many years. And I'd be remiss not to say administrations of both parties. You've been uh, uh, very consistent in your viewpoint here 
And I think that's going to serve this committee and serve the Congress very well uh, going forward, because I do think you have a unique credibility here uh, built on your previous actions. And, and so, again, thank you to our witnesses. Thank you, too, to our members. I thought the questions were good and uh, uh, showed a, a real effort to get to the heart of the matter and see if we could find some core principles legislatively that we can work together on and, and uh, move something forward. I'm sure the discussion in the Foreign Affairs Committee, while clearly not as robust and brilliant and insightful as the one you led, Mr. Chairman, uh, will be motivated by the same same kind of spirit. So uh, again, very, very productive chairman, uh, very hearing, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for making it. So thank you to all the staff, again, as you pointed out, excellent work on all sides. Uh, and so uh, I'm hopeful that this can actually uh, uh, generate some productive legislative activity going forward. With that, I yield back to my friend. Well, I thank my colleague and my friend uh, from Oklahoma for his his uh, kind words, and also for um, you know for his involvement in the in this hearing. He too has uh, cared deeply about these issues, and uh, you know to the witnesses. I mean, the Rules Committee we have to deal with everything, and sometimes things are contentious. Sometimes it's yeah you know, we can't even agree on what to have for lunch. But uh, we've come together. Uh, we come together on some really important issues, and on on this issue, I mean. There's common ground. I mean, you don't have to agree on everything to agree on something, and there's something we agree on, and we ought to, we ought to move forward. And so uh, I appreciate Mr. Cole's uh, comments. I appreciate all the members of the committee for their questions. You know, one of the blessings and the curses of the Rules Committee, well, one of the curses is that we, we don't have any time limits, right? I mean, we kind of, you know, but that's also a blessing sometimes because you get to have substantive conversations and be able, be able to flesh out some ideas that you might not always be able to do under a strict five minute, uh, five minute rule. Uh, but I really do appreciate all the members' uh, questions here. I think they were all very thoughtful. You know, President Teddy Roosevelt once said, nothing worth having comes easy. Uh, you know, we have uh, more work to do to find a path forward to reform. Uh, the way our government and the way Congress handles questions of war and peace, uh, I'm not saying it's gonna be easy, uh, but to my colleagues, I say this, I, ensuring that the American people have a say and the ways in which our nation goes into war and exits one, to reestablish communication and consultation between the Congress and the President on issues of life and death is certainly worth it. And I just want to say one final thing. You know, we get very caught up um, in policy and, and procedure and in constitutional authorities, uh, but, but these are decisions. I, I know my the witnesses know this, but these are decisions that have real-world consequences. Uh, the stakes are really life and death, you know, blood and treasure, not abstractions. Uh, they are about whether and when and for what purpose we will um, send our uniformed men and women into harm's way. Uh, we will be directing them to sacrifice their lives. We will be telling their families uh, that this sacrifice is necessary. So we need to be sure that how we make these decisions and who makes these decisions and for how long these decisions will persist. We need to make sure that that is balanced and clear and done in a way that uh, that, restrict, that re respects, um, you know, the, uh, the, the incredible men and women who serve our country uh, and also um, respects the Constitution. So I thank everybody for such a serious and informative discussion, and we will certainly be in touch with you as we move forward on this. So with that, the Rules Committee is adjourned.